C'est un grand plaisir d'être ici, dans ce lieu, dans la Généralité de Catalogne, et même dans un lieu où j'ai travaillé en tant que membre du comité des régions avec l'UFM, l'Union pour la Méditerranée, pour laquelle j'ai préparé avec Harlem un rapport très important qui a été approuvé à l'unanimité sur le changement climatique dans la Méditerranée. Et vous comprenez qu'on parle d'un des questions les plus importantes qui nous connaissons. C'est un grand plaisir d'être ici parce que Harlem a fait son premier pas ici. Il a été fondé il y a exactement 13 années, en janvier 2010, à Barcelone. Et pour nous, Barcelone reste, c'est-à-dire le symbole d'une coopération euro-méditerranée que pour nous c'est décisif pour le futur de notre pays, de notre ville et de notre, de notre région. J'ai même, excusez-moi, un raccord personnel, parce que j'étais plusieurs fois, quatre fois, en tous maire de Catania, il y a la première fois 30 ans d'année. Et j'ai eu une, une coopération très stricte avec la ville de Barcelone, quand le, le, le maire de Barcelone, qui était un bon ami à moi, c'était... C'était Pasquale Maragall y mira. Et je donne à lui un pensier euh, amical euh, parce que je suis dans sa, dans sa, dans sa ville. J'ai dit que j'ai été rapporteur pour la relation euh, sur, au sujet des de changements climatiques de la Méditerranée, mais dans le comité des régions, j'ai fait même une, euh, un rapport euh, sur le thème de des de, 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 avec le voisinage méridional euh, entre l'Europe et les pays de la Méditerranée. Et je suis donc euh, ravi d'avoir euh, l'occasion de discuter avec vous aujourd'hui de la nécessité d'un programme de transformation euro-méditerranéenne euh, dans un contexte géopolitique modifié après l'invasion de l'Ukraine par la Russie. Je crois que dans le nouveau contexte géopolitique, après l'agression de la Russie, nous avons besoin de mécanismes innovants de gouvernance, de gouvernance multiniveau et collaboratif impliquant tous les acteurs en tant qu'agents de transformation. Et le Comité européen des régions a quelques idées à ce regard. Et il y a des années, lorsque l'Union européenne a adopté sa communication conjointe sur une nouvelle agenda pour la Méditerranée, c'était déjà un moment important que pour la première fois, après euh, tant d'années, euh, une communication s'adresse spécifiquement à ses voisins méridionaux et propose de renouveler son partenariat dans l'intérêt de la paix, de la stabilité et de la prospérité dans la région. Cela a démontré, démontré l'importance de cette relation avec les deux parties. Historiquement et culturellement, la mer Méditerranée a été, à fil des siècles, une force naturellement unificatrice, plutôt qu'une ligne de démarcation pour les peuples des différents continents. Le comité des régions a invité l'Union et ses pays partenaires à promouvoir de manière concrète et appropriée le rôle de premier plan des collectivités locales et régionales dans le développement territorial proche des citoyennes. Les avantages de la coopération doivent aller au-delà des capitales, car il faut noter que les bénéfices de l'action communautaire n'atteignent malheureusement pas dans tous les territoires de ces pays. Le comité a également proposé de créer des laboratoires de la démocratie pour permettre le dialogue et l'échange à plusieurs niveaux entre les représentants des pouvoirs publics locaux régionaux et nationaux, et la société civile, et la société civile entre les trois euh, rives de la Méditerranée, afin de promouvoir la bonne gouvernance et la participation au processus décisionnel. La migration. Je suis dans une ville, Catania, qui est exactement un des portes les plus délicates de, de ces... Pour affronter. Vous pensez que dans une semaine, il y a huit années, dans ces seules semaines, j'ai reçu dans ma ville, lorsque j'étais maire, 8 000 personnes qui euh, étaient en, 
en fuga de, par le territoire de la, de la Syrie, de l'Irak, parce qu'il y avait bien sûr, vous savez, de la, de la guerre. C'est pourquoi le comité s'est félicité de la proposition d'un nouveau euh, programme visant à mobiliser toutes les politiques et instruments pertinents dont dispose l'Union pour soutenir ces partenariats globaux équilibrés et mutuellement bénéfiques avec les voisins du Sud dans le domaine de la coopération au développement, des visas, du commerce et des investissements, de l'emploi et de l'éducation. Mais vous savez qu'il y a des problèmes. Il faut regarder ce qui se marche dans ces jours en Tunisie pour comprendre que c'est une question tout à fait euh, délicate. Nous devons aider euh, ces pays, mais il faut qu'elles respectent même les choix de, euh, général de démocratie et de liberté. En outre, en outre, étant donné que la Méditerranée fait partie des régions du monde la plus touchée par le changement climatique et la dégradation de l'environnement, J'invite l'Union européenne à assurer la mise en œuvre du pacte vert pour l'Europe dans nos pays partenaires méditerranéens, dès que possible, et à augmenter les fonds alloués à cet objectif spécifique. La nécessité d'une gouvernance à plusieurs niveaux a également été un des régions pour lesquelles, il y a 13 années, le Comité européen des régions, en collaboration avec les associations locales actives dans ce contexte, a créé l'Assemblée régionale et locale euro-méditerranéenne, l'ARLEM, afin de faire entendre la voix des collectivités locales et régionales dans le processus euro-méditerranéen. L'ARLEM rassemble des représentants locaux et régionaux de l'Union et des 14 pays partenaires méditerranéens, ainsi que des associations actives en Méditerranée. Cette assemblée est un, est un lieu de dialogue et de coopération entre les pays des trois rives de la Méditerranée. Le réseau de l'Arlem compte 80 membres sous la direction partagée en conjoint du nord et du sud de la Méditerranée. Dans, le, dans cet espace exceptionnel pour le dialogue euro-méditerranéen, nous, nous nous efforçons de favoriser non seulement le dialogue nord-sud, mais aussi le dialogue sud-sud. Je voudrais conclure euh, mes mots en disant que les membres de l'ARLEM ainsi que le comité des régions lui-même s'engagent chaque jour à promouvoir la coopération décentralisée et à favoriser le dialogue euro-méditerranéen sous un très large euh, éventail de membres. C'est la raison pour laquelle je suis erré d'être ce matin avec vous. J'écouterai avec beaucoup d'attention les propositions, les idées qui euh, sortiront par cette conférence et je vous remercie beaucoup de cette invitation. Merci beaucoup. Tante grazie, signore Bianco. A continuació, escoltarem el senyor Sanem Florença, president executiu de l'Institut Europeu de la Mediterrània, l'IEMET. Senyor Florença, sisplau. Molt bon dia a tothom, honorable consellera. Benvolguts amics, dear friends and colleagues, well, it's really a, a pleasure to welcome you at this occasion. Senyor Vicenzo Bianco, representative of uh, Arlem, autoritats, participants i benvolgudes amics i amigues. Bé, unes paraules de benvinguda en aquest cas per dir-vos bé què és el que anem a començar, quin és el sentit, per què ho fem, quines en són les finalitats i quins, jo diria, inclús en resultaran ser els deures que ens emportarem a casa per intentar impulsar aquesta cooperació euromediterrània tan necessària, especialment en aquests moments. En primer lloc, dir-vos que els BetCat Days d'aquest any, el 2023, tornen a ser un punt de trobada entre els organismes internacionals i els actors de la cooperació euromediterrània. Està organitzada per la Generalitat de Catalunya, l'Institut Europeu de la Mediterrània, i aquesta, jo diria, benaurada aliança MedCop Alliance 
composada per la Comissió Intermediterrània de la CRPM, l'Euroregió Pirineus Mediterrània, l'Euroregió Egeo Iònica, l'Arc Llatí i Metsites. A tots ells els menciono expressament perquè crec que la primera obligació és agrair-los. Saludo aquí els seus representants a la seva col·laboració per tornar a organitzar aquest any aquests Metcat Days. La finalitat és proveir un espai de trobada i de reflexió conjunta sobre els reptes actuals en l'espai euromediterrani. Des del començament, ho veurem, hem anat trobant dificultats, jo diria que inclús creixent, i per tant és important aquest procés de reflexió conjunta. En segon lloc, per mirar d'avançar propostes i de proposar polítiques que ajudin a fer front a través de la cooperació euromediterrània els reptes que se'ns presenten. I la tercera de les finalitats és facilitar la construcció d'aliances, aliances que es faciliten justament en aquest espai de trobada entre els actors en els diferents nivells de la cooperació euromediterrània. Permetin-me que faci un breu esment a tres punts que em semblen interessants en el moment en què avui ens trobem. En quant al moment, en quant al lloc, ja s'hi han referit, i en quant al contingut d'aquestes jornades. Primer, en quant al lloc. Ho ha mencionat la nostra presentadora, el Palau de Pedralbes, que és tot un símbol de la cooperació euromediterrània. Aquí va tenir lloc, efectivament, la primera conferència ministerial euromediterrània que va posar en marxa aquell procés de Barcelona, l'Associació Euromediterrània, i que mirava i mira encara avui, perquè aquest és el seu gran frontispici, recàleg, diríem, de crear al voltant de la Mediterrània una àrea de pau i estabilitat, una àrea de progrés econòmic compartit i una àrea de diàleg i d'entesa entre els diferents pobles i cultures al voltant de la Mediterrània. És cert que en aquell moment, el 95, era un moment d'especial optimisme i que després se'ns han complicat bastant les coses i hem hagut d'adaptar-nos a situacions creixentment complicades i començant, jo diria, potser aquest cicle fatal el 2002 amb la caiguda de les Torres Bessones i el terrorisme i les guerres a Afganistan, a l'Iraq, a Líbia, a Síria... La crisi econòmica comença el 2008, aquell moment també potser d'esperança inicial de les primaveres àrabs el 2011, però després d'aquelles primaveres, jo diria que van venir els estius i després les tardors i encara inclús els hiverns en molts dels països. I el moment en què ens trobem ara sortint de la Covid, ara en parlàvem fa un instant, com aquests països que havien, per exemple, a Tunísia, intentat amb èxit construir una constitució democràtica, integradora, moderna, s'ha trobat confrontada de seguida a la crisi de la Covid, l'impacte de la guerra d'Ucraïna i les dificultats internes que això representa, a més de la complicació de l'escena internacional. Bé, per tant, el moment en què ens trobem avui és l'impacte de la guerra d'Ucraïna, de l'agressió russa a l'Ucraïna, que canvia no només el paisatge geopolític i posa, diguem-ne, en posició d'inseguretat a Europa. Europa no se sentia en situació d'inseguretat com ara, jo diria, des de l'any 45, i introdueix dificultats creixents en l'espai euromediterrani, en un joc geopolític tant de les grans potències que abans no hi eren tan presents ni actives com de les pròpies potències regionals que estan agafant un paper molt més actiu i no sempre de la manera més positiva. I per tant ens trobem que tenim un paisatge molt més complicat, uns reptes extraordinaris en els que si abans diguem-ne que l'associació amb la Unió Europea 
era, com dirien els britànics, the only game in town, l'única política possible, en realitat, pels països dels socis del sud i est de la Mediterrània, ara sembla haver-hi moltes altres possibilitats, algunes de les quals poden ser d'ajut i d'altres moltes poden ser més aviat en perjudici dels que s'hi embarquin. Per tant, és una situació especialment complicada que invita a això que deia abans de reflexionar conjuntament sobre la situació fer propostes i buscar aliances, buscar entesa entre els diferents actors, tant del nord com del sud de la Mediterrània, tant a nivell governamental com a de les societats civils, per fer front i rellançar junts una agenda euromediterrània transformadora, com diu el títol de la nostra trobada. En quant al contingut, d'aquestes jornades, doncs breument per orientar-nos i recordar-ho, avui hi haurà aquest seminari dels Medcat Dialogues, primer aquest diàleg que tenen expressat després d'aquestes intervencions més institucionals, diàleg entre Arab Reform Initiative i la CRPM, recalibrant, diguem-ne, després les relacions euromediterrànies en una primera sessió una mica més geopolítica i una segona sessió més dedicada a la governança multinivell. I a la tarda hi haurà aquest workshop que és el compromís de l'Euroregió Pirineus Mediterrània que lidera i presideix en aquest moment la Generalitat de Catalunya workshop dedicat als temes del canvi climàtic i els reptes que ens ha representat la situació inestable de sequera i inundacions gairebé simultàniament, per paradoxal que això pugui semblar. I demà, com saben, hi haurà els Medcar Partners Forum sobre governança i cooperació territorial euromediterrània. Bé, aquest és el programa que tenim per davant, anirem veient, per tant, els reptes que hi tenim i jo espero i desitjo per tots que siguem capaços de trobar propostes interessants que puguin ajudar al progrés conjunt d'aquest país i d'aquesta regió i que aconseguim tirar endavant aquella agenda fonamental que esmentava abans que ja ens ve des del 95 de construir al voltant de la Mediterrània un espai de pau i seguretat, de progrés econòmic compartit i d'entesa i diàleg entre els pobles i cultures al voltant de la Mediterrània. Moltes gràcies per la seva atenció i espero que hi hagi unes jornades profitoses per tots. Gràcies, senyor Florença. A continuació, l'honorable consellera d'Acció Exterior i Unió Europea de la Generalitat de Catalunya, la senyora Maritxell Serret, que tancarà aquest torn d'intervencions inaugurals. Senyora Serret, quan vulgui. Molt bé. Molt bon dia a tothom, senyor Florença, estimat senyor Florença. Lucio Bianco, Madame Zorà, directora general, delegats, autoritats, amics i amigues, cònsul, senyor Xavier Sant. Moltíssimes gràcies per ser avui aquí i benvinguts a aquesta tercera edició ja dels Medcat Days. Aquestes jornades, ho ha explicat molt bé el president de l'IEMET, volen ser un espai de trobada, un espai de diàleg, un espai de reflexió, un espai perquè els actors d'aquest espai euromediterrani siguem capaços de construir respostes, de construir ponts, de construir propostes davant dels interrogants múltiples que l'evolució geopolítica, les grans transformacions que impliquen canvi climàtic o transformacions digitals ens imposen. Per tant, aquí també permeteu-me fer un agraïment especial a qui fa possible que ens trobem avui aquí, els companys i companyes del Departament d'Acció Exterior i Unió Europea, i aquí una salutació especial a la directora general i a tot el seu equip, també a l'Institut Europeu de la Mediterrània, 
aquí també presents i a qui agraïm moltíssim aquesta capacitat de dinamització. També als companys i socis de la plataforma Medcop Alliance i totes aquestes xarxes de cooperació euromediterrània. Aquesta feina enorme i constant de persones, perquè al cap i a la fi tot ho fem persones, i aquestes institucions, organitzacions, i que som capaços de posar en comú societat civil i institucions al servei d'aquest espai comú, d'aquest projecte comú que és la Mediterrània i que és el nostre espai natural de desenvolupament. I també avui volem fer una salutació especial al Consell de Joventut de la Mediterrània i a tothom qui ha fet possible que avui es faci també aquesta trobada de la joventut mediterrània. Com dèiem, aquest espai dels Medcat Days és un espai d'incidència, d'influència en el que és l'agenda mediterrània, que, com bé dèiem, es promou des de fa anys a nivell de la Unió Europea i que ens ha de permetre de nodrir encara més, de reforçar encara més aquest ecosistema de relacions mediterrànies i que, per part de Catalunya, ho hem dit sempre, Catalunya, el nostre marc de referència, els nostres dos grans espais objectiu és una banda la Unió Europea, som Unió Europea, volem ser aquest soci actiu i proactiu en el projecte de construcció europea, però també és el marc mediterrani. La Mediterrània és el nostre marc natural, històric, cultural, de desenvolupament i de relació i forma part de la nostra manera de ser i és el nostre futur també. I el futur d'Europa passa també per la Mediterrània. Per tant, amb tota aquesta iniciativa, també des de Catalunya, ho emmarquem en aquesta estratègia mediterrània que hem anat construint al llarg dels anys i que s'ha concretat també en aquesta estratègia Medcat amb visió 2030 i que, com desgranaré, estem ja posant el focus al 2050 i que també intentem anar concretant amb accions, perquè al final de les paraules hem de ser capaços de baixar amb accions, amb impacte real del desenvolupament comú i que volem anar desenvolupant també amb els plans d'acció que ara estem iniciant pel període 2023-2026. Per tant, el lema d'aquests Medcat Days de Transformem la Mediterrània, com bé deia el senyor Florença, ens trobem amb aquest impacte venim d'inèrcies i tendències passades, però sobretot l'impacte que ens ha fet a donar la Covid i la guerra d'Ucraïna que les vulnerabilitats hi són presents i que, com dèiem, amb crisi climàtica, que sens dubte és el gran repte que tenim al Mediterrani, s'agreugen segons quines amenaces i es poden iniciar derives no volgudes i no desitjades per qui volem prosperitat i democràcia. Per tant, tenim nous reptes, tenim nous escenaris i el que hem de fer és tots aquests interrogants, ens els plantejarem durant aquests Medcat Days i hem de ser capaços de construir, com deia abans, respostes plegats, respostes en positiu, respostes per construir. Perquè tenim cada vegada, i ho hem constatat, com dèiem, la Covid o la guerra d'Ucraïna, ara de manera molt palmària, tot i que ja que en som conscients que això sempre ha sigut així, tenim interdependència, depenem els uns dels altres, no uns més que uns altres, no. En termes d'igualtat ens necessitem i per fer front a la crisi energètica, per fer front a l'impacte del canvi climàtic i les crisis en aliments i que sabem que la conca mediterrània és on més impacte tindrà aquest canvi climàtic i que més afectarà allò que és essencial per la vida. Ho estem veient amb la sequera, per tant, el recurs bàsic de l'aigua, però també la biodiversitat i, per tant, les possibilitats de desenvolupament i de qualitat de vida arreu. Per tant, tenim aquesta voluntat. Des de Catalunya hem expressat també aquest compromís en les diferents xarxes com amb l'Euroregió Pirineus Mediterrània, i aquí saludar també el seu secretari, i amb aquesta lluita conjunta que estem iniciant també amb altres socis a nivell europeu per trobar solucions conjuntes a aquest repte de la sequera que ens està afectant però que, insisteixo, no ens podem quedar només en una riba. Hem de tenir una perspectiva global mediterrània. Compartim reptes i hem de compartir solucions. Necessitem transformar. 
I necessitem fer-ho, a més a més, defensant, i ho deia també abans el senyor Bianco, defensant un model de diversitat i de llibertat i de democràcia. Perquè estem també davant un auge de discursos populistes, xenòfobs, autoritaris, excloents, en tot el Mediterrani. I aquests discursos sovint s'aprofiten o es basen o sorgeixen de la por, de la por dels canvis, de la por de les transformacions, de la feblesa que suposa l'absència de propostes. I per tant, aquí avui també ens emplacem a tenir aquest coratge, coratge a l'hora de fer propostes, coratge a l'hora d'afrontar els interrogants i fermesa, fermesa en els valors sobre els quals vestim les propostes i les polítiques, valors democràtics, d'igualtat, de preservació i defensa sempre dels drets humans. I per això també ens comprometem a seguir col·laborant i cooperant, afavorint l'apoderament i ajudant-nos a transformar necessàriament les nostres societats en benefici mutu i en prosperitat compartida, contribuint per la nostra part des de la Generalitat sempre amb aquesta vocació de contribuir, d'estar predisposats a contribuir a fer realitat una agenda euromediterrània que compleixi i ens acosti als objectius de desenvolupament sostenible. En aquest marc, les reflexions d'aquest matí ens han d'ajudar a repensar i transformar les relacions euromediterrànies 20 anys després de la creació de la política europea de veïnatge i uns mesos abans de la cimera de veïnatge que hi haurà en el marc de la presidència espanyola de la Unió Europea aquí a Catalunya el novembre que ve. Perquè l'ambició transformadora de les relacions euromediterrànies per impulsar la recuperació econòmica inclusiva i sostenible demana un compromís, demana agendes compartides. I per això creiem que cal reforçar i renovar l'esforç i establir mecanismes innovadors, com dèiem, de governança multinivell i col·laborativa que anunciava també el senyor Bianco i que hem treballat a nivell europeu al Comitè de les Regions o també al Parlament Europeu. Des de Catalunya, com dèiem, tenim aquesta estratègia MEDCAT 2030. Durant els primers quatre anys de la seva implementació hem desenvolupat ja més de 800 actuacions. Tenim un nou pla pel període 23-26 i el que volem fer també, i tibant de l'oportunitat d'aquests MEDCAT Days, és ser capaços d'enfocar tot aquest pla també amb totes aquelles propostes i respostes que anem construint mútuament. Volem que la nostra agenda euromediterrània sigui un treball compartit amb els veïns i veïnes, les regions, les ciutats, els àmbits que compartim. I com deia abans, amb aquesta visió en l'horitzó 2050 i també amb aquesta capacitat de bastir una governança multinivell col·laborativa amb uns valors que ens permetin reforçar les aliances transfrontereres, transnacionals i interregionals, treballant en xarxa, sempre amb aquesta visió que emana també dels valors sobre els quals volem que es basi l'acció exterior de la Generalitat de Catalunya, de ser útils útils a la ciutadania, a les institucions catalanes, però també útils a les nostres contraparts per establir relacions de confiança i guanyar cada cop més credibilitat i amb un impacte real de les accions i de les polítiques sobre el benestar de la ciutadania. Per tant, treballant en xarxa i aplicant, com deia, aquests projectes euromediterranis sobre uns valors ferms. Tenim clar que els nous reptes marcats per l'agenda mediterrània de la Unió Europea són també oportunitats per construir aquest espai integrat, intel·ligent i sostenible amb una vocació de fer un creixement inclusiu. I per això també ens cal no només institucions i les polítiques, sinó també la societat civil. La societat civil organitzada, impulsant la participació dels joves, la plena igualtat de les dones i la seva implicació, com dic, en aquesta transformació innovadora i en aquest sentit també, i ho hem dit abans, aquesta governança multinivell, des de també l'àmbit més local i regional proper a la ciutadania. Necessitem que s'avanci en un context de gestió cada cop més descentralitzat, més flexible i adaptatiu. I aquí l'aposta política que impulsem de Catalunya, però no sols, també amb altres governs, companys i companyes, per exemple, Regió Sud, 
para acá, ¿no? de, de, del sur de Francia y, y de otros gobiernos regionales que estén, y locales que nos estén aplegando sota la plataforma de los amigos de la macroregión mediterránea, porque creemos que cal impulsar este proyecto de macroregión mediterránea. Y aquí saludo también a los compañeros de Metsites, a quienes compartimos esta vocación y voluntad de reforzar la cooperación multinivel, de ser más eficientes en los recursos y aquellos proyectos que volem que tengan un impacto real local y que doni toda la credibilidad a la ciudadanía de que estén al seu costat para hacer frente a reptes tan greus y tan importantes como el cambio climático y, como de abans que ha rebut el suport del Comité de las Regiones y del Parlamento Europeo. De fet, just la semana pasada también a Marsella, el presidente de la Generalitat, junto amb el presidente de Marsella, feien también en la Cimera sobre el Agua una, una, un reforç y un compromís a reforzar esta alianza de macroregión mediterránea. Yo mateixa la semana pasada vaig poder visitar Tunisia, no? reforzando también estos proyectos y estos lligams de treball conjunt respecto a cultura, no? cultura y lenguas de català y árabe, pero también sobre el papel de las dones y de los jóvenes en proyectos concretos que afecten y que impulsen el su protagonismo en el desenvolupament local. Y también a París, a Francia, a diferentes actores y también miembros del Ministerio de Exteriores francés, a quienes constatemos también a ellos que este interés común para reforzar esta gobernanza multinivel, esta necesidad de políticas a impacto real en, en los territorios. Y sobre un tema también muy concreto, como es, por ejemplo, la gestión de la agua. Tenemos, por tanto, desafíos mediterráneos, sí, y que necesitamos afrontar conjuntamente porque el futuro es compartido. El presente es compartido y el futuro también ha de ser compartido. Necesitamos esta respuesta integral en políticas más adaptadas a las realidades locales, ser más útiles a estas necesidades de la ciudadanía y sentirse las personas, los ciudadanos, las instituciones, en hem de sentir todos plegados más propios para ganar toda esta aquesta credibilidad y reforzar también el que es el valor de la democracia. Calen más políticas euromediterráneas pensadas conjuntamente, políticas veritablemente transformadoras. Y para eso, para trabajar mejor, volem reforzar nuestros instrumentos de gobernanza amb la participación de la sociedad civil también catalana y de los principales agentes que hoy nos acompañan aquí. El compromiso de Cataluña en la Mediterránea nos abre nuevas oportunidades de alianzas, de iniciativas estratégicas y de transformación y no les volem ni les podemos desaprofitar pel bé comú, pel bé de las nuevas generaciones. Volem transformar la Mediterránea en políticas públicas que propicien cambios genuinos, no només paraules, no només discursos. Necesitamos impacto real de las políticas y, por tanto, volem acostar las políticas a la ciudadanía amb esta gobernanza multinivel, amb la implicación no, de los gobiernos locales y de los gobiernos regionales. Políticas que tengan un impacto positivo en la salud y en la educación, en la economía y el progreso, en los ecosistemas y la biodiversidad, en la cultura y la lengua en el desenvolupament ple de les persones, individualment, col·lectivament, comunitàriament també. En definitiva, en la vida de la gent de la Mediterrània. Per tant, us convido a aprofitar molt aquests Medcat Days per conjuntament fer aquestes reflexions, compartir problemes sí, però sobretot construir respostes en bé de la nostra ciutadania arreu de la Mediterrània. Moltíssimes gràcies. Muchísimas gracias, honorable consellera. Eh, entrem doncs, en materia y comencemos amb el primer diálogo. Convidem el señor Nadim Jurí, director ejecutivo de la Arab Reform Initiative, y al David Estrangis, secretario general adjunt de la Conferencia de las Regiones Periféricas Marítimas, a pujar a la estrada para participar en el primer diálogo de este seminario en que hablaremos de la situación geopolítica y de las agendas transformadoras para la Euromediterránea. Okay, that's going to be in English. I will introduce you in Catalan, then we start in English. 
Molt bé. Abans de començar, una petita presentació dels senyors que ens acompanyen. Nadim Khoury és director executiu de l'Arab Reform Initiative, va estar durant més d'una dècada a Human Rights Watch, va engegar i dirigir a Beirut i posteriorment i antiterrorització. Síria i Jordan. No se sent? Ara, gràcies. Deia que el senyor Jurí ha treballat per Human Rights Watch durant més de deu anys amb unes... experiència sobre aquest territori. És advocat de formació, va treballar a l'ONU com a advocat adjunt de la Comissió Walker, que va investigar les denúncies de corrupció del programa Petroli per Aliments a l'INE. El senyor és secretari general adjunt de la Conferència de les Nacions Perifèriques Marítimes, expert en acció exterior de la Unió Europea i en cooperació territorial internacional. Ha coordinat desenes de projectes sobre qüestions com ara economia blava, turisme sostenible, en tot cas intentaré parlar una mica més fort perquè em sent I'm sorry because we have some audio pro we start with you you have been for many many years in a so called MENA region so you have a deep knowledge of the region considering the impact of Ukraine war and pandemic consequences and uh, structural problems of this region. What we can change? Uh, how we can expect to change in this region? Uh, Just in. Good morning. Uh, buenos dias. Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the organizers. I hope everyone can hear me. I know there were some translation problems, but... Um, you know, I think the, the relationship and the region has not been doing well for a long time. Uh, and the, uh, being here in Barcelona, one cannot but remember the optimism in the mid-1990s and frankly the cynicism uh, that we're living here today. You know, um, uh, the, we're here discussing the future of, of the Mediterranean, the sea that we all love, you know, the sea that has been the cradle of civilization. And at the same time today, the central Mediterranean is the deadliest migrant route in the world. So this beautiful sea, the sea of, uh, has become uh, a death trap. And I always say, uh, insanity is, not, I mean, I'm quoting Einstein here, but insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. By that, I mean, uh, we've hit a dead end. This is my conviction these days. We've hit the dead end for the region and for the Euro-Med relations. And if we keep continuing doing what we're just doing as business as usual, we cannot expect different results than what we have seen for the last 15 years. What do I mean by that? The uh, social contract at the southern Mediterranean is broken. And it's been broken uh, for a long time, and this is why we ended up with the Arab uprisings. Um, it hasn't been fixed. There was perhaps a short moment of optimism between 2011 and 2013 for maybe a reset button, first of all in the region and across the Mediterranean. That was missed. Um, then things got worse with COVID, and now uh, Ukraine, uh, it's actually interesting that we talk about it because obviously Ukraine is very present in the psyche and a very geostrategic moment for Europe, but if you go talk to people in the southern Mediterranean, they shrug. They don't care. Ukraine, you know, I mean, they're affected by the inflation, but they say it's not our war. We have enough wars. So how can we press the reset button today? How can we uh, acknowledge uh, the fundamental differences? Uh, and, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it. But I think um, there is a key element that can be played. Um, I often hear, because now I'm based in Paris and I go to Brussels a lot, I hear many people in Brussels tell me, well, Europe just a uh, real politic better. You know, we have to compete with Russia, uh, the Gulf countries, Turkey. I think, uh, I think if uh, Europe decides to play this game, it will lose. Mm -hmm. Because Europe 
first of all, does not speak in one voice. Uh, secondly, does not have, uh, and, and luckily, does not play as dirty as some of the other powers, including Russia, China, and the Gulf, and Turkey. And Europe would be losing its strategic comparative advantage in this relationship of cultural exchanges, of the diasporas that are already uh, in Europe, the long history of relations, the languages, and, and so forth. So maybe we'll, but you know, the region is doing really badly, uh, just to kind of conclude on this point. <laughs> the region is doing really badly. Uh, I don't think the answer is going to be just do a bit more geopolitics. Uh, the competition that we're seeing between European countries in the southern Mediterranean is terrible. I mean, I'll just be very honest today because I think we need to be very honest. What Italy and France are competing against each other in Algeria, in Tunisia, and then we're here to talk about the common EU policies. The generals in Algeria, the uh, autocrats in the southern Mediterranean, and they see this. And so they play off one against the other, and they try to get the best deal. But the problem is, whatever people are thinking of gaining stability now, you know, if we just do deals with the strong men to stop the flows, I just have uh, one question to ask. How well did this work out with Erdogan in Turkey? How much money did uh, Europe pay for Erdogan to play migration cop? Now they want, then they did the same with the Libyan militias. And now they want to do the same with Kaisa Said in Tunisia. Are things doing better? Sorry, I'm very frank because I think the moment is a moment of us being frank, particularly in this city that represented so much hope for Euro-Med relations. point of view of regions, which are the challenges who can transform the area, how we can work together, uh, can we work together in solutions, uh, questions like such migration or climate change, for example? Thank you. <clears throat> Hello to everyone. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. That's a pleasure. Uh, thanks to the organizers, in particular to Generalitat uh, de Catalunya, uh, one of our founding members of the Conference of Peripheral Maritime Regions, and to IEMED, uh, which uh, is one of our key partners when it comes to Euro Mediterranean cooperation. So um, I would like to make just a short parenthesis, uh, just because I am answering on behalf of the regions, but I have to explain a bit what we represent. The Conference of Peripheral Maritime Regions is uh, an organization uh, that was funded in the 70s, so it's almost 50 years old. Uh, we have 150 members uh, from 28 uh, countries of the European Union and some countries of the neighborhood policy, uh, the neighborhood south and east. We had also, um, some years ago, regions uh, in Ukraine, like Kherson, uh, and we are quite peculiar because we are um, organized in geographical commissions. So we have one for the Mediterranean, one for the Balkans and Black Sea, etc., for the Baltic and so on and so forth. So it's um, an organization that works on different policies uh, that are connected to the key challenges of the regions and uh, does a lot of lobbying, think tank, but also project activities. Having said that, um, what I can say uh, at level of key challenges that I see for uh, the future uh, in the Mediterranean and also at level of transformative challenges uh, you, are, you were asking, I think for sure uh, we can maybe divide, think of two big blocks of challenges. A first block I would say that's the most important with the structural challenges, uh, including, for instance, precisely climate and energy transition. Uh, and this includes, um, in my view, both, of course, adaptation and mitigation challenges. Uh, you would go uh, and look at the environment we are living in. So environmental challenges, um, the protection uh, of biodiversity, um, and also the capacity and the resilience of the territories to um, all these challenges, including also the capacity to um, 
react to extreme weather events. We have seen recently also, for instance, in, in Emilia Romagna, in Italy, but everywhere in the Mediterranean in particular, the effects uh, of the climate change, but not only. So it's also about the capacity of um, the society and the governments and the uh, private and public sector to prepare the territories for resilience and to prevent and respond to all of this. And you could think about um, other uh, challenges that are more like phenomena, like demographic challenges, demographic phenomena, and migratory phenomena uh, that we are seeing and of our uh, east the very beginning and then I would add uh, a fourth big challenge which is uh, democracy and participatory connected to that we have a lot of other specific challenges that could constitute all opportunities for instance I can I can think of the sustainable blue economy sustainable blue economy can be a big driver for cooperation in the Mediterranean at European level but also at Mediterranean level and that's precisely what um, is happening on the ground. Uh, we are seeing some strategies already, like BlueMed, WestMed, Uzer, and many other at European level that are now starting to try to connect more also with the mm -hmm. southern part of countries and eastern part of countries in the Mediterranean. Then uh, I think there is a big challenge uh, that um, is about greening the industry and make it more uh, innovative and competitive. And that's, you, we have seen the response of the European Union with the, uh, to, to the IRA of the USA with the Green Deal Industrial Plan, for instance. And that's, I think, uh, key because uh, we are fighting uh, to have less dependence from China, for instance, when it comes to raw materials, critical raw materials, developing key technologies uh, in Europe uh, and uh, key technologies that can help this green and blue transition, uh, including, for instance, I was speaking about blue economy, we can think about marine renewable energies, for instance. Mm -hmm. So uh, those two challenges um, are very practical and very specific and deal with socioeconomic development, but then we can think also about other two that for me are transversal, and that's the youth inclusion, the inclusion of the youth, uh, and also gender equality that was stressed also uh, by Minister Salet just before. I think these two are connected to the challenges of participatory democracy too. So uh, there is a lot to do, I think, and we can, uh, um, of course, also think about this from the point of view of multi-level governance and the territorial, let's say, approach to those challenges, which I think it could be really an added value. While you were talking, I was thinking this, you have a lot of work. <laughs> uh, today and tomorrow we talk uh, about the, the idea of together, Junts together. But not only talking about the Mediterranean Sea, uh, but also at different levels of government and actors who can work together to go ahead in, in our work. Huh? Mr. Huri, from your uh, Arab Reform Initiative, which is the role that civil society must have to, to improve these Mediterranean relations? Um, thank you very much. No, there's a huge, I think there are very important opportunities, uh, I think for civil society, uh, but also at the level of local uh, government. But maybe let me just start saying, if we think of civil society as simply a technical fix, you know, for coming up with suggestions, recommendations, uh, it hasn't worked over the last few years. But uh, so we need to, uh, I think where civil society and research centers uh, like the Arab Reform Initiative, like IEMED, like EuroMESCO, like all these institutions, what we can do is develop a joint agenda. And I think this is where civil society has a real responsibility is to really reflect on what could be a joint agenda uh, that can re-engage, hopefully, uh, the political will. And I think this is very important. Because in the last few years, there's been a tendency to think of civil society as implementers, technical implementers of agendas. And, you know, it hasn't been very successful, to be honest. Uh, why? Because, you know, we're talking about local governance. 
So at ARI, we, look, we worked on for 12 years now on decentralization. You work on decentralization. You work on youth trying to enter politics, for instance, in Tunisia. They had a quota system for the uh, municipal elections. And then one person comes to power, and they disband all municipal councils. In Egypt, they haven't had municipal elections, local elections, and I don't know how many years, I think 10 or 11 years. Uh, in Lebanon, they keep postponing uh, municipal elections. So if the civil society is only saying, we're gonna train a few youth to run for elections, and then there will be elections once every 12 years, and they disappear, we will not be successful. If we can have an opportunity to think creatively about how to build common agendas on renewable energy, on sustainability, on a different kind of economy that can be, uh, that can mitigate and adapt to the changing circumstances. I think this is where civil society could really build that. And to do this, I think we need three components. One, um, we need to listen to each other better. Mm -hmm. We need to really listen to each other better. Uh, and given the power dynamics, I think our European partners need to listen to a bit more to what the southern region has to say. Uh, because, uh, you know, a few years ago, um, it was all about terrorism, counterterrorism. This is what everyone wants to talk about. So if you're a civil society in the region, you want to get funding, you were working on countering violent extremism, preventing violent extremism, and this was the agenda. When ISIS was defeated, it was now shifted to be migration. So it's all about migration. Come and talk about migration, and we want to listen to you, what you have to say about migration. Mm -hmm. And the same people who used to work on CVE, PVE, now they work on migration. This is not serious. You know, uh, uh, we also need to listen to what people have to say. Uh, uh, environment is actually a very interesting space for collaboration. Uh, it's essential, and it's also a very good way to work with local communities. But what are we seeing in terms of investments, in terms of the Green Deal? The sort of investments we're seeing mostly are massive investments that are not helping on governance. So it's about building the biggest solar power plants, and what are we going to do with this renewable energy in the southern neighborhood? We're going to export it to Europe. So uh, if I'm being very cynical, it feels a bit like extractive industries, again, with the same political economy, because who is benefiting, who is building these massive solar power plants? It's big industries connected to the uh, power in place. Local communities are not benefiting in terms of electricity, job creation, and so forth. I actually, it was interesting, I just saw last week a documentary on green hydrogen here in Spain and how people, I think, in Andalusia are very upset about some of these massive uh, power uh, solar plants to, to create green hydrogen. It's the same dynamics happening, by the way, in Tunisia and in Morocco. Local communities are very upset about some of these projects. Does this mean there's no space for collaboration? Of course not. I think there's a lot of space for collaboration. But again, the first point is we need to start listening to each other mm -hmm. uh, a bit more. And I think on both ends, I think people in the southern Mediterranean and in the eastern neighborhood, they also need to listen about the fears of Europe around things like Ukraine and, and others. And that begins, so better listening. I think too, uh, perhaps to go back to linking the needs to a bigger political project. Again, I go back, if, if we want to succeed, if we want to have this transform, transformative agenda, like the title of this session, for the Euromed, there needs to be a uh, common political goal. We need to dream again, mm. you know? And this is not about being naive. There needs to be something that unites us. Because again, if we leave it as purely a transactional agenda, do this for me on this, I do this for you on that, okay, that's very legitimate. But then Europe would be one amongst many players, and as I mentioned, probably not the player that has the best cards for mm -hmm. this region. So there needs to be a, uh, a key element. And here, civil society and the politicians have to, uh, have to meet up uh, on this to really reignite that flame that this Mediterranean, this region, can actually work together, complement each other in a much better way. And the third, uh, and I'll just conclude with that, what common agenda? There'll be many common agendas uh, that we can think of. And I think this is where values are important. I know it's very passe these days to talk about values, uh, democracy, human rights, no, you know. Um, uh, when I say sometimes these words in some meetings, I can see people roll their eyes. Um, and they say, but this is not a realist moment. Actually, I think this is the most realist approach because I have a sense of deja vu here. Uh, you know, I always like to tell a story before 2011, 
Tunisia under Ben Ali was a poster child of the IMF and the World Bank. It was an example of a supposedly successful Arab economy. I don't know if people remember this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you'd open the, go back and look at the IMF and World Bank reports from 2008, 2009, 2010. It was a successful story, you know. Uh, in 2015, 2016, uh, when I used to go and people would tell me, look at Sisi, he's doing wonders for the Egyptian economy. Um, I like to remind people of this, that's the problem. I always take notes and I tell them, you remember when we used to tell you this is gonna go into a dead end? Look at the economy of Egypt today. Riyad Salemi, the central banker of my country, Lebanon, was supposed to be a wonder kid. Turns out he has 400 million hidden in European bank accounts. So um, this is not realist. Doing again what we've been doing, what we tried in the 90s and the 2000s and 2010s and expect that in the 2020s with the bigger challenges are gonna to lead to different results, it's not gonna be the same. I think we can collaborate on energy for sure, on food for sure, mm -hmm. uh, on culture for sure, on a new hope, maybe not to go back to, may, yes, there will be some things that failed, you know, there's not gonna be an easy transition in the region, but rethinking what it means to have local collaborations, have things that work, I think Europe has the expertise, it has done it on its eastern uh, front, and realizing that this geopolitical moment, because Europe is so concentrated on what's happening in Ukraine and in the east, and this is perfectly legitimate and natural, mm -hmm but that this competition, it's a bit like a new Cold War we're entering, and we're seeing it in Africa with Russia, with Wagner, and what they're trying to do, then I think Europe has to be strategic, and it has to really think about having almost like a Marshall Plan, not because it wants to help the region, because it wants to protect its own backyard. It has to be strategic. Can we have this vision? Are there politicians today who think they can sell this to their population? Currently, I think I'm doubtful, but right now I'm not hearing anyone even try to present the argument. And I think part of what civil society, uh, what your question was, I think part of civil society is to try to say, we need to do something different. Mm -hmm. We need to do something more ambitious. Yes, it might look very hard in this day and age when everyone's counting euros and how much you're gonna spend here and how much you're gonna spend there, but to also have an honest conversation and say that the alternative is going to be more costly and the reason we can say that, because we have three decades of experience and we know that it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. Mr. Strange, from your own experience, uh, can you see a possible uh, more inclusive and participative uh, relations in the Euro Mediterranean region? Yeah, um, uh, I think uh, I'm a positive person. I would like to <laughs> think so. Um, I also share the doubts that um, you have just mentioned, but I think that we need to think positive. We need to have this dream. Uh, and to do that, I think that there are some key instruments and tools that can help us walk together through this transformative path. Uh, one of which was mentioned this morning, um, in the intervention of uh, Minister Serret, the post potential uh, macro region, Mediterranean macro region, is not, of course, a panacea, is not uh, the solution per se, but could be a mechanism to, um, let's say, foster this dialogue, an inclusive dialogue, a multi level dialogue that could really put together possibly uh, local regional governments that basically now they are the engine that are proposing this kind of collaboration together with key stakeholders at territorial level, civil society, chamber of commerce, universities. So we are looking, if we look to the, let's say, um, subnational level and to the uh, organized society and also the economic sectors, we can see that there is this will to collaborate this is, there is really availability to collaborate, there are ideas, there is dynamism. Where we find more reticences, I would say it's more at state level still. Um, also, of course, it's uh, kind of uh, natural if you think about it. Um, it's about also status quo, power and control. But these mechanisms, uh, if they are really co-owned, 
uh, if you really can work together in a gradual path, build it together on a voluntary basis, and um, start step by step uh, from uh, the biggest challenges where you can find also the best ties, uh, like starting from precisely uh, pressing issues like climate, environment, things that uh, bond us uh, the best at the Mediterranean level and that can allow for cooperation uh, with less competitiveness, let's say, approach. Um, I think we could really do it in the future. Still, at level uh, of, uh, let's say, formal initiatives, this is uh, still at embryo level <laughs> because we have many other macro regions that are working at European level. Uh, but still, uh, this uh, hasn't been asked for because that's the procedure from the Council of the European Union uh, that needs to give the mandate to uh, the Commission to prepare then a communication and, and start a dialogue also with the rest of uh, states. Uh, but I think we are pushing from different directions, the European Parliament, the Committee of the Regions, the Mediterranean Cooperation Alliance, to arrive sooner or later. It's, a, it's true also that it's a, uh, more than 10 years that we're speaking about this potential collaboration. And of course, politics uh, have, uh, have not helped, uh, of course, in the last 10 years. They will not help maybe also in the future. So maybe it's time to dream, to dream big and to start to put really our hands uh, on it. So I, I would be positive, but of course recognizing that the situation uh, is critical. But I would say also that it's very important that we find solutions with a, a multi-level governance approach that can really bind all the elements of society. Mm -hmm. I will keep your uh, honesty and your optimism. <laughs> Thanks both for this dialogue. And now we stop here. We have more work to do today and listen to each other. Thank you very much. Després d'aquest diàleg, continuarem aquest seminari que avui i demà espero que els hi doni temps de parlar de moltes coses, treure'n molt profit. Sabem que hi ha molta feina, no l'acabarem, però seguim endavant. Moltes gràcies. Okay, so good morning. I will ask uh, participants in the first session, in fact, to, uh, uh, to come and, and have a seat. Hello. Ah, sí. Okay, so it's uh, really a pleasure to have you all in here for this first session, recalibrating the European relations in the wake of the war of Ukraine. Eh? So we all hope that you will kind of uh, illuminate us as to see where we are and where we are heading and what can we do to improve things in, in this extremely complicated uh, period. Uh, we have an extraordinary panel for that in this occasion. And uh, if I can find my papers, we'll be able to proceed. I will not add 
more things to what we said before. And so we'll go immediately um, to our participants. And in the first place, we have Luis Miguel Blanco Padilla, who is the spokesperson in Arabic of the European uh, External Action Service. And uh, while well, he's a career diplomat, he's been posted in different countries, and now he's based in Beirut as the spokesperson, as I was saying, of the European Union, uh, well, the European External Action Service, but in Arabic. And I, I really advise you that it's a good idea to hear at his uh, speeches in Arabic, I would say extremely powerful and uh, incisive and uh, extremely convincing, I would say. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a special novelty because I think it is the first time that the European Union speaks directly to the Arab people, to the Arab societies in Arabic. Of course, some of the representatives, the normal representatives uh, in the countries speak Arabic, but they speak about the problems in their place, usually. But to have uh, a spokesperson in Arabic representing the voice of the European Union every day, that's, that's uh, really a novelty. And I really admire Luis Miguel Bueno Padilla for the job he is doing. I know he's prepared uh, a special presentation for that, uh, and so we will watch and hear it uh, with uh, all our interest to get this kind of introduction to the subject. So thank you, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Ambassador. In fact, I'm not sure the presentation is gonna be on the screen, um, but uh, I'm not sure because, you know, there was a glitch, uh, but uh, happy to be here. Without the presentation, the presentation is here. I have it. I can explain it to you from my computer. <laughs> but, I mean, instead of boring you with a PowerPoint, I think uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just highlight a few, a few issues. You know, first of all, as Ambassador said, uh, it's the first time that, uh, that the EU has a, a dedicated person on a regional level to speak to audiences across the region in Arabic, from Morocco to Iraq, including the Gulf. And uh, as I said to, to the ambassador, it's, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure and honor and also quite scary, in fact. Uh, it's quite scary because, you know, it's a, it's a big responsibility. And every time I do an interview on media, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, whatever, I have to wind back or rewind and say, did I say something wrong? Did my, did my phone ring? Do I have any WhatsApp from anyone in Brussels firing me? Because it could happen. You never know. Uh, now, the first point I'd like to make is Ukraine has been a turning, uh, the invasion of Russia in Ukraine has been a turning point a turning point, a major turning point for us. Uh, and I'm gonna be speaking about communication more than policy, but uh, on all fronts, right? As you, as you know, uh, the, the invasion of Ukraine is set, is set off a dynamic that is unprecedented in, in US history. You know, there's, uh, it's, for the first time, the EU is uh, supporting a third country militarily. The treaties of the EU are not, uh, don't allow the EU to do these things. You know, NATO does, does these things, not the EU, European Union. So, you know, uh, Nadine was mentioning before, the, or somebody was mentioning the geopolitics, uh, right? Geopolitically speaking, this is a massive uh, thing. It's a massive uh, turning point. Communication-wise, it's been a disaster. Okay, let me, let, me, uh, let me be frank with you, because you were frank, I'm gonna be frank too. It's been a disaster, why? Because, of course, very few people in the region understand why the, we Europeans are I would say obsessed even with, uh, with supporting the Ukrainians. When I started my interviews, and I did 150 interviews last year on Ukraine alone um, in many channels, the same questions will come up. <coughs> okay, so you Europeans, you're supporting the Ukrainians, what about the Palestinians, right? The what aboutism? What about the Iraqis? Hmm? You invaded Iraq. And I always say, well, we did not invade Iraq, excuse me. No, no, you did, you the West, because they put you in the same box as the West. Uh, what about the Libyans? Well, the Libyans, you know, Gaddafi was killing people. We went with NATO. Uh-huh. And what about the civilians that NATO killed? No? So this question has been recurrent all throughout. The what aboutism? What about us? You know, we have many wars in our region. You never really care. We, we had a war in Syria where crimes of atrocities were committed 
And we haven't seen the same level of commitment on the, on, on the part of European countries towards accountability, towards ensuring that doesn't happen again, and so on and so forth. So when you're confronted with this uh, criticism, you have to understand a bit how you are perceived in the region in the first place. And this is the presentation I have prepared for you, but I'll run through it really quickly. I don't want to be long, but just know that, in fact, the EU has a pretty good, uh, or the EU is perceived in a good manner in this region. Now, we, uh, I mean, for example, we have more than 50% of uh, interviewees or polled citizens in the region perceive the EU as a positive actor. More than 55% perceive the EU as, a, or the EU agenda, or the cooperation between their country and the European Union as being uh, impactful. Um, Morocco, for example, if you want to take a country, 77% that would describe the EU relation as very good. Palestine is the next, 75%. And then you go down and you get to Egypt, 39% only. Uh, the knowledge of the EU, right? If you go to the Maghreb region, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, it's pretty well known. You know, the people know what the EU is about. If you go to the Maastricht region, in particular Syria, no one has a clue. I mean, very few people know what the EU is about. Lebanon a bit more, Jordan is the best. But if you go to Syria, Egypt, again, 25% of people know, 25%. Uh, Egypt, Egypt is a massive market, a massive country, so. Um, but when the war in Ukraine arrived, we polled with Gallup. We have a poll, uh, a collaboration with Gallup, and we polled people. And it was surprising to see 23% uh, of all interviewees thought that the reaction of the EU towards the war in Ukraine was, had impacted negatively on the perception of the European Union. And 26% did not change their perception. So more than 50% of people said, no, it's either negative or we don't really care. Which goes to the point that you mentioned, in fact, this is not a war, it's another European war. And the high representative, Mr. Borrell, has been touring the world, right, in the region, in fact, saying, look, this is about international law. This is not about, this is about international law and upholding the multilateral system. This is what we care about as Europeans. The European project is based on that. And the response is getting, or has been getting is, yes, but why don't you, Europeans, uphold the system everywhere in the same manner? And in particular, the South African minister was quite eloquent in that sense when, when he went to South Africa. And again, second <laughs> point I wanted to mention, the first is perceptions, very mixed and worsened by a reaction to Ukraine. The second point, and not to be too long, is disinformation. There's a massive battle going on in the region. It's called, Mr. Borrell calls it the battle of narratives. And I had the privilege of sitting down with Mr. Borrell and I told him point blank, we're losing this battle, uh, Mr. High Representative. We're losing sure. it big time in the region. Uh, there's no way we can win it. You know why? Because I'm in Beirut, I opened the, I'm driving to work, I listen to the radio while I go, and what do I listen to? Sputnik Arabic. Mm -hmm. What do I listen to? Mm -hmm. RT Arabic. And all the disinformation narratives that the Russian is spreading across the region. And not only that, yesterday I was reading an article in the Shark al Ausat, which is a major newspaper, you know, based in London. And a very respected um, opinion or commentator, uh, analyst, was saying, no, no, as you know, the Europeans and the Americans were training the Ukrainians years before this war happened. So therefore, you know, uh, the Russians are right in saying, ah, you know, we're defending ourselves. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is the Russians are present everywhere in the region and been there and they're investing big time in having commentators, analysts in all channels. I will go to Al Jazeera, do my thing for five minutes. Before me and after me, there'll be a guy from Moscow, impeccable Arabic, propelling this information, lies and so on and so forth, the, the narratives from the Kremlin. So. You know, this is, this is going on everywhere in the Arab world, and beyond Al Jazeera and Arabia, the third major channel is Arti Arabic, in terms of audience in the region. So just imagine. Now, this has an impact on opinion polls, but it also has an impact on policy. States, there's not one single Arab state or in the Mediterranean region that is aligned completely with the EU thesis on Ukraine. Not one. You can name, I mean, you can challenge me on this. I can tell you whether or not that in fact, some are not only that, but they're very ambiguous. They're not condemning the invasion, they're very ambiguous. Third point, just, uh, and I'm going to finish here, Ambassador, is the reaction of the EU. What have we done? What are we doing? In fact, yours truly, I'm doing what I can in my little corner, um, but uh, there is a lot to be done. <coughs> in fact, we created a, a network of analysts, information analysts, that are uh, scanning the, the infosphere across the region, right? 
from Morocco to Iraq and so on, and detecting anti-EU narratives and try, that try to feed into policy. We're trying to a bit, you know, push a bit the boundaries. Uh, I mean, Ambassador Moran knows that, uh, you know, the Brussels machinery is quite complicated and rigid, but it's true that we need to adapt. We cannot just expect others to follow. No, we need to understand and put ourselves in their, in our, in their place, you know. Uh, and actually, the High Representative said that many of the countries share uh, the same principles, but they have different priorities, right? And so here, uh, I'll finish with this, is, you know, the, the idea now is to build, uh, let's say, a consensus among communication experts in the EU, increase the content in Arabic, not to compete with the Russians, but to tell our own story. I think we should not shy away from telling the story. Um, why do we care so much about Ukraine? This is what I'm telling my, my friends, my journalists, my friends, uh, my, you know, uh, journalists across the Arab region is, it's simple, you know, uh, you know, this war is geographically in Europe. The European Union is a project that is about peace. Essentially, it's a project to solve or to avoid another massive war uh, in the European continent, in the world. An Ukrainian goes to Poland or a Polish go to Ukraine, in three months, they'll be talking fluently the language. It's if I, if I go to Italy. It is only normal that th this alone, or this, uh, let's say, uh, solidarity happens towards the Ukrainian. It's not about blue eyes and, 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 and you know, as some people were saying in the region, uh, this criticism, oh, you're not taking the Syrians because they're Muslims and so on, and you're taking the Ukrainians because the Christians have blue eyes. Not exactly. It's about four member states of this project, peace project that border Ukraine. And therefore, it's natural that four or five million people will go into the EU, and so on and so forth. So long story short, you have to explain. There's a pedagogical effort to be made here. We, and, and, and in this sense, you have to break a bit the boundaries of the rigid communication that we have in the EU and try to a bit push the limits in terms of engaging with audiences in, in, in the Arab world. And I think I'll end there. So thank Robert, you. Thank Robert, you very Robert. much, really. Uh, now you will understand uh, what I said before, the impact that he is having in the Arab audiences. Uh, it's a kind of a novelty, and you see the, the excuse me for expressing it so, the conviction with, it, uh, with which uh, he expresses the, the, the European voice in this complicated part of the world. Uh, and so we now understand a bit better uh, about the complexities of this uh, war of narratives and, and how uh, we play usually in a disadvantaged position and what should we do as we are doing to overcome this uh, situation to give our reasons in a more clear and explicit way to our uh, partners in the other side of the Mediterranean. Now we'll go for another angle to tackle this uh, uh, with uh, Lori Haitayan. Uh, she's uh, been a senior officer of Natural Resource Governance Institute and uh, an expert on, on uh, energy affairs, among other things, and uh, therefore, uh, she may explain us uh, how the impact of the war in Ukraine in terms of the energy landscape and the interests of priorities of the different stakeholders uh, in this complicated business uh, whenever uh, oil, energy and geopolitics get mixed together. This is usually a very explosive uh, situation. Uh, how can you help us to understand it better? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. And just a correction that I've been promoted like five years ago to the, ener to the executive director or the MENA director at NRGI. Anyway, just that. But it brought me back to the years uh, when uh, I was trying to understand the region and oil and gas, etc., and the energy transition. Anyway, just uh, one thing uh, uh, to add on what uh, uh, Luis had said about uh, the narratives. Just one thing that is happening, in the, in, at least in Lebanon, it's Sputnik, Russia today, they're buying airtime. Exactly. So because the radios are in financial problems, so they're accepting that, or some televisions, because they have financial struggles, so they are taking that money and like, agreeing on airing what the narrative is. So that's something that the EU needs to look at to see if uh, uh, Deutsche Welle was doing something like that, yeah. buying airtime and uh, doing that. So that is one model that they can look at 
uh, just to fix things. So it's not out of convictions. Sometimes it's more out of necessity and finances. And even on energy, and we'll come to that, even on energy transition, it's out of necessity sometimes that countries are moving to renewables more than anything else. We'll discuss that. So to tackle uh, the issues, so definitely the uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine uh, had, was an energy, uh, an energy story as well. And uh, definitely uh, it exposed the, the uh, European uh, dependence on the Russian uh, gas and energy, big time. Uh, and the European citizens had to be faced with that reality. The second reality that they had to face, it's like this here, uh, ideology or the theory or the concept that they based on uh, their model for years that interdependence, economic interdependence would lead to stability, especially that was something that the Germans were pushing for at the EU level, that as long as we involve the Russians economically into uh, that big picture, so they will be uh, stabilized or neutralized. And we've seen that that concept had been really uh, put into question, uh, because we've seen that there are certain thresholds that once you get past that threshold, like this interdependence didn't make much. On the contrary, Russia used that weapon against, uh, against Europe. So Europe was facing an existential problem, uh, which kind of uh, um, brought them all together, because there was a lot of skepticism that ah, the Europeans, this is a very fragmented uh, machinery, bureaucratic, they take time to take action, etc. So they, everybody will freeze in Europe. So that was it, like they will not be able to take decisions and then the, Europe, the European continent in, the, in winter, they will be freezing. So uh, they had mild winter, but more than the mild winter, it was like they really worked really hard on putting regulations, policies that really made them go through 2022, 2023 with success. So at least that really brought them together to work really strong on putting all the uh, regulations that saved the day. But at the same time, I guess the energy security issue floated back and energy, tra energy transition was a bit put under uh, uh, as a second ranking, but never forgotten about that. So suddenly it was about energy security for the short term to medium term, but without forgetting the energy transition, long term uh, policies uh, that they had and the targets that they had, because some were saying in the region, like, look at them now, suddenly they want our gas, they want our oil, they forgot everything about energy which is not the case. So they had that in mind, but directly they needed to find solutions for their imminent problems because the decision was taken to end the dependence on Russian gas and they were really successful <coughs> in doing so. And they reduced their consumption and they reduced their need of the uh, Russian gas. And this is something that is uh, it's amazing to see what, uh, what Europe has done. So basically, uh, and, the, and the International Energy Agency and now is saying that this push for energy security doesn't mean that less to do on energy transition. On the contrary, energy security now means independence, and independence means more deployment of renewable energy, which is produced in the countries, which will give them a sense of independence. And therefore, energy security today is linked more onto energy transition than even uh, before. So this is what was happening on the uh, European uh, side. So this immediate need for gas and, uh, and other products uh, made them look into the neighborhood. So who's the neighborhood, who's the closest? Definitely uh, there was, an, uh, there was uh, like uh, visits into, to uh, North Africa. So basically it was North Africa mainly East Mediterranean, so where uh, Egypt and Israel, Lebanon uh, are, and Syria, and then to the Gulf. So this is how they divided their approach to finding immediately solutions and to replace a certain percent of the Russian gas uh, by uh, the neighborhood uh, uh, gas and uh, oil products. So basically, uh, you've seen uh, parallel tracks. Individual countries, mainly Italy, taking action directly, going to North Africa, direct, uh, and going to uh, Algeria, uh, making deals with Algeria, uh, billions of dollars to be invested in oil and gas. Plus, 
on renewables and plus on energy transition project. But mainly they were going there to ask for more gas so that they help them into, uh, uh, into uh, uh, using less of the Russian gas. They went to Libya as well. So they used all the historical card that they had. So ENI with the prime minister going hand in hand to North Africa, talking to Sonatra, talking to the Algerian government, talking to Libya, talking to the National Oil Corporation there to make sure that there are projects, there is investment going to go into investing into the oil and gas sector, but at the same time investing in renewables and investing in decarbonizing even the oil and gas sector, which is one of the issues that uh, the oil and gas companies think they should be doing, like, yes, continue producing, but at the same time decarbonize that to so make it less uh, emissions from that sector. So this was the immediate action that was taken by Italy. At the same time, the European Commission was playing an active role as well. So uh, 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 the President von der Leyen with Commissioner uh, uh, Kadri Simpson went to Egypt. They signed an MOU with Egypt-Israel saying that we want the Israeli gas to flow through the Egyptian infrastructure to come to Europe. At the same time, the Lebanese, the Israelis, were fighting for a decade over a maritime border issue. Suddenly, because of Ukraine, Russia, it was becoming a security issue, an important issue, national security, so France was pushing for it. The Americans used that card, like saying, like, you guys, once you do the deal, you Israelis are going to sell your gas to the European, and you Lebanese will become so rich that... You will not, uh, you, uh, some were saying they will not need the IMF program. This is in Lebanon, but like encouraged by the European Union, encouraged kind of by the Americans as well. So a deal was made. Decade-long dispute was made possible because of the uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, war. So on the other side, for years and years, the European Union is fighting long-term contracts on LNG and gas. And suddenly it became possibility and Qatar signed a deal for 15 years of gas to be sent to Germany. So these were the landscape, these were the changes that we're seeing. Suddenly we're seeing that that rush to the, Europe, to the neighborhood to bring more gas, but at the same time being really true to the energy transition pledges, to be frank with them, because on every contract that was signed, on every MOU that was signed, there were a lot of... Uh, uh, that, uh, language around energy transition because they want to maintain the thing. So one, two, may, uh, two points and I'll stop there. So basically <coughs> to understand because we're talking about this relation. So there is going to be more energy relations in the region it, uh, between Europe and the, uh, and the neighborhood, the immediate neighborhood and even like with the Gulf as well. So, and we are seeing this pivot by the European Commission on having more of strategic dialogue, having more of strategic spaces for the EU GCC countries. Uh, talking about energy uh, transition, talking about hydrogen, talking about like uh, renewables, talking about many uh, things related to, uh, to energy. But more importantly, so that we speak the same language, because sometimes we speak a language they speak, and the European Union speaks another language. For the European Union, maybe the energy transition issue is a climate issue, is an environmental issue. It's not the same for the region at all. Tunisians will tell you, I want more solar panels, I want more solar energy, from, like renewable energy from solar, because it's a national security matter. Today I cannot provide electricity anymore to my people. I cannot afford buying that electricity. So for countries in the region, they cannot afford anymore importing the fuel that is very expensive. It's becoming expensive. And because they're financially pressured, their budgets are on deficit. And so it is a matter of national security to be able to go for something that is maybe homemade, that will create jobs at the same time will be less expensive than importing. So this is something important. For the producing countries in the region, they want to have more solar, uh, solar energy or renewable energy for the electricity, not because of the climate and everything. It's because they need to spare the capacity, they have the spare capacity of selling more of their gas that will keep producing to bring in foreign currency to be able to provide to the social stability in the countries. So it's completely different why they are going into energy transition. It's completely different why they want to deploy more renewables. And this is what you need to understand. It's not about climate. So if you keep on talking to them about climate, 
It, yeah, they know it's getting hotter in the cities, but they are going into renewables because it's about social contract, it's about social stability, it's about financial pressures, and it's not about the environment. So it's important to understand what are the incentives of each. My final point on that is, again, because we were discussing, and I get, think I agree with Nadim about this vision for the, the Mediterranean, and more importantly, I think it's for a vision for us in the, uh, in the Middle East. Mediterranean, so and the three divided, North Africa, Eastern Mediterranean, and the Gulf. We, we are in a very, very sad situation. Morocco, Algeria, they're fighting. So this is a problem for, uh, for Europe. You want the green energy from Morocco and you want oil and gas from Algeria. If these two countries are fighting, they want you to take position. What position are you going to take? Because you need the energy, both energies. The prop Tunisia is defaulting. Uh, Libya, no one knows what's happening there. Forgotten. Dispute, not dispute. So even if Italy wants to get their gas, they don't know at any point that it could stop because they could fight like each other, like the, the, the divisions inside the country that no one is solving. Egypt is, is, everybody knows what the economic situation is in Egypt, but how much money you are going, or the Gulf is going to keep on putting money into the central bank to stabilize it, because these are like 100 million people that might like be, uh, uh, be left in, in a chaotic situation. Uh, 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 Palestine, uh, even Israel, like this existential problem that they have and every Saturday and going fighting for the existence of Israel and the spirit of, uh, the, of what they, uh, they created. Lebanon, failing. Syria, failing. Iraq, because now they have money, they're stabilizing. If there we have like a, a decrease in money they, in, the, in the oil prices, they will have problems because their ec ec economy is just standing on oil and gas, which is not going to be something that people would want in 2050. What will happen to the Iraqis? Because they need to live beyond 2050. Yemen, completely collapsing. So who is standing in the Gulf, in the, in the region now? It's Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the satellite around them and Qatar to some extent. It cannot be that three countries only are having like an economic boom and the rest of the region is doomed. So it doesn't work that way. So the vision is like, how can we create that vision in the region? And this is where it comes helpful with the EU. Now you created that vision of a united European continent. So how can we do? I know, I've never seen anyone talking about this. Can we bring the, Euro, the, the Arab countries together or the, like the Middle East? countries together, to work together, to create that economic force, that social force, etc. So it is a big challenge. So this is where the work should be with the EU on how to create that vision among ourselves. So the Arab League needs to be boosted to become an inspiring league, not to become that place where they go, I don't know what they do, and then everything is prepared, and then they just go do this, the, the, the theater, and then they read this, uh, this statement at the end, and that's it. it. It cannot work. It cannot work. So there is a vision for the region among ourselves in the, Mediterranean, in the Middle East, and then to be able like, to talk to the Europeans on a level of vision to vision, or on a level of, uh, uh, of more of of collaboration, but now it cannot be you just give us money so that we stay in our countries, we don't come to you, it doesn't work anymore. Thank you. So thank you very much, Laurie, really, thank you for bringing, bringing us uh, the vision from the other side, because it is true that uh, some people are uh, working on that, uh, as Luis Miguel is doing, uh, but he represents the voice from the north, thank although you. he is at the same time someone who is there, uh, uh, looking around and, and, and telling us what can be seen with European eyes, but you brought us uh, the other side of the coin, the other perspective, uh, and we have realized once more that uh, uh, energy is, is a key point uh, in many, many, many different respects, uh, and is especially a key point in, in geopolitics, but not only that, uh, it's a key point in, as you said, in many countries of the social contract and the stability, political and, and social stability in the countries. And now we turn to another uh, perspective to the issue uh, with uh, Ambassador James Moran. James Moran is a career diplomat, he's been working on the area for many years and, and mainly 
we've invited him uh, because he's a close friend of the IMF, <laughs> uh, working with us uh, very often on, on this kind of uh, affairs. And he, he was the European Union ambassador to Egypt in a recent period, and so he can explain uh, his point of view uh, what's going on, uh, what's the impact of the uh, uh, war in Ukraine uh, in South and East Mediterranean countries, and what has that changed in the, in the perspective of the European Union, uh, how should we therefore adjust our policies uh, to cope with these new immense challenges. So, uh, James, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, and how nice it is to be back in beautiful Barcelona. Uh, and thank you uh, to uh, you and the authorities for giving us this fantastic venue today. I must say it's very impressive, very nice. Nice to be here. Uh, although um, outside there in the region, in the Mediterranean, things are not quite as peaceful and elegant perhaps as they are here, we should of course all keep that in mind. The title of this session is Recalibrating Relations in the Wake of the War of in Ukraine. Well, in the wake of, we're not actually in the wake of it yet, we're in the middle of it. And I listened very carefully to uh, Nadim Houri earlier on and uh, Vasco as well talking about this. And I agree, there is a need to dream. Uh, much as I think happened here in Barcelona back in the mid 90s, there was a dream back then. A new dream uh, probably is needed. However, it's a bit difficult to dream when you have a nightmare going on on your doorstep from the European perspective, which of course is the Ukraine war. The thing is that uh, whether the bandwidth politically um, is there right now in Europe to have that sort of dream, to move ahead, have greater strategic clarity, um, whether it's there so long as we have the war in Ukraine going on, I really don't know. I would hope so. Uh, because the so-called southern neighborhood, and I think that term, by the way, has run its course. We have to move on from it. But I think um, uh, the partner countries of the region uh, need uh, a great deal more thought and attention than they're getting at the moment. And I think we're treading water. But there are reasons for this, and I think it is understandable if you look at the broader situation, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. In terms of context, I think, we've, uh, okay, people talk about Ukraine as being a turning point. There's another turning point, which is very important for the region. Um, and that is the acceptance that Mr. Assad takes up his seat in Cairo at the League of Arab States. I think I say that because uh, that, to me, marks the end uh, of the so-called Arab uprisings, I'm not going to use the word Arab Spring, I don't think we need to do that, but nevertheless it is the definitive end of the story. We were almost at the end a year or two ago with the developments in Tunisia, which have been extremely negative, I think, uh, for that country, but nevertheless um, uh, we have now reached it with, uh, with Syria. Now, um, okay, and uh, since we take, I mentioned Syria, we then move on a little bit to the new context. And, the context of what everybody refers to as geopolitics. The European Union was not created uh, to deal uh, with spheres of influence, Westphalian sorts of maneuvering and so on, um, which we now see going on very much in this region and around the world. But it's having to learn on the job. Um, and it is to some extent doing that. If you would have told me when I was uh, representing the Union overseas years ago that European Union taxpayers' money will be used to supply lethal weaponry to anybody, I would have told you to go away. That's just not in the DNA of the European Union, I would have said. Well, not anymore. We now see that uh, there is a major effort going on to supply Zelensky and his troops uh, with uh, lethal weaponry, now being used, uh, now being used, as we see on our television screens, uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine. So, there is a learning experience that's going on, uh, and it needs to be accelerated, especially uh, in the region, in the MENA region, and indeed in the Gulf, uh, when we look at what um, others are doing. In that context, we see, of course, uh, the Russians entrenched uh, in many places. Uh, most recently, we've seen their influence, malign influence on the situation in Sudan, 
where Mr. Hermeti's uh, forces are supported by Wagner and their gold mining interests. But we also see, we also see that Russia's ability to project power in the region has been pretty well hampered because they are tied up themselves uh, with their effort with their invasion uh, in uh, Ukraine. Um, and I think on the whole, if you look around the region, um, regardless of the fact that they're building nuclear plants in Egypt and a few other things that's been going on, I think the Russian influence uh, has probably peaked. They seem to be a little bit on the back foot. It would make sense when you look at the big picture, given the trouble they have militarily in, um, in, in the Ukraine theater. Um, on the other hand, China, um, nobody's spoken about that yet, but China is, of course, a highly influential actor now in the region. I mean, apart from Belt and Road, it is now, I think, uh, and Ayumed will know this uh, very well, it is now, I think, on a par with European Union trade in MENA and indeed in the Gulf, almost everywhere. I think in some countries it's overtaken the EU as the number one trading partner. Certainly that's true in the UAE. It does that, of course, as we know, to, project, to protect its interests, its economic interests, and so on. But more importantly, there is also the move of China into the political field, which I think is fascinating, what is going on at the moment with, uh, uh, first, the Saudi-Iranian uh, rapprochement, uh, which was, of course, brokered by China. It was going on, we know, for many years beforehand in Oman and elsewhere, but it was the Chinese that provided the diplomatic muscle for that uh, very important um, agreement to be made uh, and to patch up to some extent the situation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Good news possibly, I think, for the Yemen conflict. Wouldn't it be nice to see one of these conflicts around the region actually reaching some sort of solution, some sort of outcome, uh, rather than just grinding on and on and on? Uh, perhaps this will help uh, uh, that situation. I certainly, I know the UN envoy, Hans Grunberg, is quite optimistic and he's got reasons, I think, uh, uh, to be so. China's also said it wants to be more active in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, yet to specify quite how that would be. Mahmoud Abbas is going to Beijing, I think, as we speak. I think he's leaving today. He'll spend three or four days over there. First trip in many, many years. It's an interesting one. Um, of course, I mean, um, I think China does this as much to poke the United States in the eye uh, and to some extent the Europeans as well, but primarily the U.S., uh, rather than to be terribly serious about a new peace plan for, uh, for, for that tragic part of the, of the region. Um, uh, where is the EU on the Middle Eastern situation? I'm sorry, it really is. Uh, you mentioned, one of you, I think, earlier, the uh, problems between France and Italy over Libya. But when we look at the situation of the EU on Palestine, it's very depressing. Um, uh, we used to be able to speak more or less with one voice. These days, it's very, very difficult. You have a group of countries, uh, not just the Visegrad lot, but some others too, who frankly make it very, very difficult for the EU to have any meaningful position. Uh, Mr. Borrell is left high and dry very often, having to make his own declarations, not on behalf of the member states, uh, when it comes to uh, the Palestinians. And you've got the far-right Netanyahu government with Mr. Smotrich and Ben Gavir running around talking about ejecting the Palestinians, killing the Palestinians, wiping out their villages and so on. And the EU, I'm afraid, has been pretty well cowed in response. The Americans have actually pushed back harder on these issues than Europe has. We have a real problem there. We've got to get to it. Um, but look, um, we also support in Europe uh, the so-called Abraham Accords as being a way towards peace in the region. Well, that's all very well, but uh, I'm frankly wondering what on earth value do these accords have so long as you have the Palestinian issue out there getting worse and worse with every passing month with the possibility of a third intifada down the track. Uh, and as for the Saudis signing something, the Americans are trying to, of course, facilitate that. Uh, it's going nowhere and the Americans have been told, I know this directly, have been told a week or so ago in Saudi Arabia, the highest level, forget it. Uh, there's no way we're going to sign anything with Israel so long as these people are behaving uh, the way that they are uh, in uh, the Middle East. And then you have, of course, a uh, quick word on Turkey because we've just had the election there. And Turkey, of course, as we all know, is a big player, not least in uh, Eastern Mediterranean gas and oil. Uh, and there are many, many um, uh, issues, too many to talk about now, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe and indeed the rest of the region. 
Uh, we've got Erdogan uh, still trying to make Turkey great again, but I think he's in a much weaker position after the election. The country was pretty well divided, and his economy is in smithereens. Much needs to be done to put Turkey back uh, on track at home, and this, I think, will have some, um, uh, some consequences for the way that we in Europe and the rest of the region uh, deals with Turkey. That being said, Turkey is a big factor. So you have, uh, and of course you have the Saudi Arabians and the Emiratis themselves projecting power in the region. It really is um, uh, an extraordinarily, you use the word complicated, it's, it's even more complicated than it was before. How to, how to deal with all of that? How to, where does it leave Europe and the European neighborhood policy uh, in this new context? Well, um, if you look uh, to that, um, I think uh, we have a serious, serious problem. Um, the current, um, the current uh, direction of travel on the neighborhood policy, uh, I think, is circular. It seems to be going round in circles. I'm not sure very much is being achieved uh, right now. The new investment plan, the so-called um, 30 billion euro that was supposed to be raised under the um, new agenda of 2021. Some progress has been made on that, especially when it comes to green investments and so on around the region, but I think there's a long way uh, still to go. The point about value chains, reshoring, friend shoring out of China and the Far East into North Africa and elsewhere, that didn't go too well, not surprisingly, uh, because although um, there are some Again, some successes, Morocco comes to mind. Overall, competing with China on, um, on, on, on value chains is turning out to be almost impossible. Most European companies prefer to stay with what they know and stay with the high levels of productivity, even if the labor costs are higher in China. So that's not going too well. Yes, the green transition stuff is uh, working uh, to an extent, but there was nothing in the new agenda, and there still is nothing, on the European side in terms of uh, concessions on trade and investment, especially trade, and agricultural trade in particular. Nothing is being done on that front. And I don't think anything will be done anytime soon. The European Commission seems to be uh, distracted at the moment. But until you give a little bit more flexibility to trade, and especially on agriculture, many, many countries of uh, the region uh, are not going to want to uh, engage on all of that. Reforms. Well, um, there's much to be done. Uh, we all know that in the region. Uh, the so-called policy dialogue that was proposed in the new agenda uh, continues. Um, uh, some success is there, but uh, not a lot. Um, and uh, it's very hard to get reform when you have the regimes that you now have in the region, not least those that with a military, um, a military color. You see this in Egypt above all. Uh, where uh, essentially it's a very protectionist mentality that you're dealing with. It's very hard to open up trade when you have uh, you know, that sort of mentality on the other side of the table, and that's not about to change. Uh, it may have to change because the Egyptians are in such a mess, they've had to go back to the IMF and promise to get the military out of the economy. Inshallah, inshallah. <laughs> it's been promised before uh, by Mubarak uh, and, uh, and others way back They've never actually managed to do it. I hope they do, because if they don't, uh, the country is going to be in an even worse situation a year or two down the track. 100% now of uh, GDP uh, as debt. It was half of that when I was serving in Egypt. But, for the European point of view, we have to be very careful. Uh, we need Egyptian gas. Uh, Laurie has been telling us about that. Uh, we need Lebanese gas, we need Algerian gas, we need uh, whatever we can get. Uh, so, in terms of, uh, of how we deal with these problems uh, under the new agenda, it's not so easy. Corruption, a uh, big problem. The IE Med survey brought that out a year or two ago. Well, it's a long list, uh, but it isn't going... Uh, migration, finally. One word on migration. I see that uh, Mrs. von der Leyen was in uh, Tunis, I think, yesterday. I think she was supposed to be there. I didn't really, wasn't able to check, but I think she was, uh, to present this new policy which has just been... Agreed, the Italians came over, and now we have a brand new, well not brand new, but it's being talked about for quite some time, arrangement for uh, the migration uh, uh, problem. Um, we'll see how that, how that goes. But again, it's, it, it, the, what's driving it is not a vision, it's not a dream. It's very transactional, it's keeping people out of Europe. 
It's not enough. This is a very defensive agenda. It's not a proactive one. Where's the dream? Going back to uh, Nadim's uh, point, it's not there at the moment. Now, um, I think uh, I'm going to finish this off because uh, otherwise I can talk about it all day, and we all can. Uh, I suspect um, that the neighborhood approach and concept has run its course. I think the time has come to consign it to history. It was essentially a Eurocentric idea right from the beginning. A Eurocentric idea primarily for the East, and everybody then said 10, 15 years ago, ooh, what about the South? Barcelona process is going nowhere, let's have something new. And everybody thought, well, perhaps it's a good idea, it might release more resources, it might give more attention to the South. So let's tack on, and it really was a tack on, a residual to the overall neighborhood idea, which is that uh, with the, uh, the white people with blue eyes, we can add the, uh, the Mediterraneans and we can make it into one big package. It never worked. It never worked. It was never going to be that way. It was hard enough before, um, uh, the Arab, uh, before we had this uh, uh, period after the end of the Arab uprisings. There was a brief period during the Arab uprising when it looked as though it might make a difference. But I don't think it's making its uh, difference now. We essentially have a normative idea that they want to be more like us, masquerading uh, as a transactional process right now with the neighborhood policy. It's neither one thing nor the other. It's neither fish nor fowl. It's neither chalk nor cheese. It's time to move on from it. The question is, and we need greater strategic clarity uh, in order to be able to do that, the question is, uh, how do we do that? And, and how can it be uh, a process which is better adapted to the new context of uh, how to engage with uh, the uh, great powers, how to engage uh, competitively and also cooperatively, uh, not, not only the United States, of course, but uh, as I said, above all, less Eurocentric in conception. I don't think there's any easy answer. Uh, the IE Med is working, I know, on many ideas, and thank God it is, because it's one of the few places which is giving the right sort of attention to these issues. Uh, there are other discussions going on in Brussels and think tanks and so on. But I think, for the moment, the bandwidth isn't there. It's more a nightmare than a dream, Nadim, unfortunately, right now. Thank you. I'll stop there. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for illuminating our, our way to look at it. Uh, from this, uh, from your experience, mainly in, in, in the Middle East and, and specifically Egyptian uh, area, um, I know that there are differences between the Maghreb countries and uh, Egypt and the Middle East. Maybe uh, <coughs> Egypt was never as much engaged in the Euromed game as, for example, Tunisia was in good times, and Morocco, because for them, uh, well, the association with Europe is, is a much more meaningful thing because of their commercial ties and all kind of, of uh, ties with, with, with Europe were stronger. But the point is that uh, what was perceived in Europe as the exception, countries that were not following mainstream Euromed way, uh, is now becoming uh, the, the rule for everybody, even for the countries that were actually following it. And uh, we, we have seen it in many different uh, uh, ways, and uh, specifically talking about the impact of the Ukraine war, it has been pointed out, uh, of course, by everybody, uh, how puzzled the Europeans felt uh, seeing the attitudes they took or the aggression, clear aggression, uh, they don't deny it, uh, of Russia uh, in, in Ukraine, how distant attitude was taken by most of, well, by all, in fact, uh, South and East Mediterranean countries and the Arab world in general and the global South in general. And so that, that's, uh, again, another strike in, in our way of seeing things. And so there are many things that we have to, to, to lose or to abandon this uh, European-centered uh, uh, perspective on it and take on board 
the perceptions and the interests uh, from the other side. Otherwise, it would be difficult to make it advance. And then to express what our attitudes in a more clear way in this uh, crude barrel of narratives that's now taking place, because uh, uh, we do have uh, many strong reasons to believe that this is uh, a feasible dream, eh? uh, but there is a long way to go meanwhile. And now we, we, we come uh, uh, to another perspective with uh, Farah Al Shami. She's a senior fellow at Arab Reform Initiative, uh, specialized in this uh, part of the, uh, of the world. And, uh, well, I think she is well positioned mainly to elaborate on the socioeconomic consequences of the war and what this means for the Euro Mediterranean relations. So you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador, and thanks again for the invitation. Uh, so basically, yes, uh, from a socioeconomic perspective and from an economic perspective, and as I try to give this snapshot, my presentation will indeed echo so many ideas that were already mentioned today. So um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine actually caused this like twin basic commodity uh, crisis, the oil shock, all kinds of like crude petroleum byproducts, residual products and gas, and the food shock from wheat, grain, vegetable oil, and even the fertilizers if you are to speak about agriculture. This caused, as, we, as we've been talking, severe deterioration, deteriorations in the global supply chains, including through increased cost of production and uh, increased cost of transportation and also so shortages in many uh, in uh, the countries that are on the receiving end. Um, the consequence, economic consequences were disastrous, but one of the most flagrant and one of the main consequences that have led to socioeconomic repercussions is actually hyperinflation, um, including in some contexts galloping inflation because these contexts such as Egypt, such as Lebanon, such as Tunisia that is following suit to Lebanon and to Egypt in terms of the uh, economic and financial crisis, there the hyperinflation turned into galloping inflation because these countries had already a predisposition and are facing depleted foreign exchange reserves, uh, especially that were even accelerated by the war in Ukraine as they tried to shift to alternative markets for their imports and they tried to offset the lack or their inability to import from Ukraine by resorting to the US, to Canada, to India, to Romania and to farther uh, uh, markets. And actually also the decrease in investment, the decrease in tourism, the loss uh, on, on, on this part has also deplete, further depleted their foreign exchange rate uh, uh, their foreign exchange reserves and at the same time not only as a consequence they could at some point not afford to import their needs uh, to, for self-sufficiency from an economic perspective and social perspective but also they had to lift subsidies on food and on energy so this in a nutshell has disproportionately impacted the poor and the most vulnerable in uh, the southern Mediterranean speaking about children women youth the elderly rural population and the urban poor, informal workers, the refugees, people with disabilities, and many others, especially concerning um, or especially taking into account the initial susceptibility of uh, these different social groups. And this is by increasing the cost of living uh, indeed, but also uh, by more specifically incre increasing uh, the price of the food basket. Um, in contexts that already f suffer uh, food insecurity, if I am to give a few uh, statistics, the cost of the food basket per household per month increased in uh, Lebanon between 2021 and 2022 by 351%. So it's a three-digit inflation. Uh, in Syria, it's a two-digit inflation. It's by, by 97%. And in Yemen, it is by 81%, according to the World Food Program. Uh, this came coupled with no or very weak social protection schemes. And it also came uh, on the top of energy poverty that these contexts have been already suffering. These contexts just to date, I mean, don't have access to electricity full time and still suffer uh, power outages and uh, power, very frequent power cuts. Um, so this um, status quo that I described has, what, what it did is that it slowed down the COVID-19 recovery, the recovery from COVID-19. And it came indeed to overlap with other crises, including a global one that we, not, we don't tend to forget about, but that we don't speak about more often, uh, often which is the manufacturing uh, supply chain from China. 
the manufacturing supply chain from China because China did not recover, especially from COVID-19 because of it is, its overstretched COVID policies. And until now, the Chinese economy hasn't uh, recovered. Um, as a result, more than one third of the Arab population are currently under the poverty line. Unemployment exceeds 12% on average, this including the GCC. So if we are to, to take the non-GCC, to exclude the non-GCC, that will be on the upper bound even more. And the unemployment rate for youth is more than twice uh, the regional unemployment rate, and both rates are more than twice the world average. So it is a very bleak uh, diagnostic indeed. Um, now, even multidimensional inequality was exacerbated and the cleavage between the southern uh, shore, the, 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 southern, the southern part of the basin and the northern part of the basin was widened. And so the gap was widened between resource-rich and non-resource-rich uh, countries. And this is what was already actually mentioned. So what did this do? It actually, what it did is that it exposed the reliance, like the heavy reliance on Russia as the world's gas station and on Ukraine as a key supplier of, uh, of, of, of food um, uh, primary resources. Um, it exposed the fact that the Euro-Mediterranean region is always, not, it's not homogeneous, but the southern Mediterranean is on the receiving end. Um, however, this shock was transitory. We have to admit that the supply chain has already started to adjust. It has already started to recover somewhat. <laughs> Um, now we can see that the Mediterranean is flooded, as, as it was mentioned, by the oil and gas from the GCC. Um, so GCC and oil exporting countries like Algeria, we can see them benefiting from the inflationary spikes, uh, making more revenues, they're happy, and we can see a, a diversification in the supply chain. We can indeed see that, and we can sense that there is a political will uh, from, from the EU member states to actually move in that direction, to actually benefit from the diversification of the supply chain, uh, of the proximity to the GCC, and to, uh, uh, to actually use the GCC as an alternative market, although this is not disclosed or this is not admitted publicly. Um, and it, in addition to the GCC, this has been reflecting in Morocco and in Turkey in the boom uh, in the car industry, for example, just recently. So this is reflective uh, of, uh, of this fact. What does this say? This lends proof to the fact that the Euro-Mediterranean region is very interconnected, as, as it was mentioned earlier. It is very uh, interconnected. However, despite being interconnected, it is most disintegrated. And this constitutes the central idea of like, the, the remaining of my presentation, being most interconnected but most uh, dis disintegrated. Uh, now, indeed, many ge geopolitical developments have been taking place. Like we can mention, to enumerate a few, the Abraham Accord, the maritime deal uh, between Lebanon and Israel, the Saudi-Iranian deal with China being the mediator, as it was mentioned, uh, with Syria uh, being uh, back to the League of Arab States and the naturalization with the Syrian regime. Um, we can see many geopolitical changes happening. Uh, most of them, or many of them, for investors, for the private sectors, can provide positive forecasts. These are indicators of positive economic forecasting for the private sector and for investors. But others, like, for, and for example, one on the positive end also, the fact that Russia, to date, only controls 20% of Ukraine. So we can feel that al although we are still in the middle of, the, of the, the Ukraine crisis, of course, but we can see that Russia lost a lot of military personnel, military equipment. It is now in retreat. It is not in an invasive situation anymore. And we can feel that this war is not sustainable. We do not see, but you, you may disagree with me, but we do not see that, we sure. cannot see that, for example, Russia is in a strong position, and it is a war of attrition uh, for it. So this is on the positive end. On the negative end, we can see so many conflict hotspots in uh, Sudan, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and we can also um, see other indicators, for example, uh, as uh, Lori was mentioning, the exclusive econ economic zone in the Eastern Mediterranean basis. So the schisms happening there can provide negative forecasts. So we've got negative forecasting indicators and positive forecasting indicators. And as a result, these uh, mixed signals or mixed um, um, uh, forecasting factors uh, cause uncertainty. And in economics, when there is uncertainty, this is only, it comes to the detriment of growth and it comes to the detriment of investment and of uh, recovery. And this is why the IMF has projected that 
um, or has estimated the lowest growth rate uh, to, be, to, to happen this year uh, and, to be, and for, for that to be the lowest in 30 years, including uh, when it comes to the Euro-Mediterranean region. Uh, region. Um, this whole also um, uh, picture was exacerbated by the high interest rates globally because high interest rates decrease investment, decrease re the potential for recovery, decrease productivity, decrease job creation. The contractually mo monetary policy was first, it started with good intentions to contain inflation, to reduce inflation, but eventually it is even uh, further slowing down uh, the, the recovery. And I mean... Uh, despite that, uh, we can see that the economic recovery is s starting. Like we can see some, um, as I said, the market is adjusting. But the socioeconomic impact of this economic shock when the Ukraine war first started, uh, it's not recovering. We, we do not see uh, improvements on the level of socioeconomic indicators, although we see improvements on the level of economic indicators. Uh, and that is because the capital allocation that happened is not now coupled with uh, strong redistribution mechanisms because the impact of the labor market on the labor markets is, is usually a long-term impact, it's not a short-term impact. So while economies have a large propensity to adapt, we it's by theory that the, the society, uh, from a socioeconomic perspective, the society does not have uh, a large propensity uh, to adapt. And this theory is called the hysteresis uh, theory or the hysteresis phenomenon in economics. So despite like, the slight improvements that we are seeing, the socioeconomic uh, landscape and prognosis is still very bleak. Speaking about the EU now, the role of the EU, the EU is not playing the role that it should be while facing this impact, especially from a socioeconomic perspective. Instead, the EU is in a position that I can briefly describe as um, a trilemma between climate action, social justice, and democracy. There is a trilemma between these three parameters or three, three, these three pillars, or we could, I mean, probably not call it a trilemma, but an impossible trinity. So if they get two of these, they're not able to get the third. And this is what I'm going to try to prove in, um, uh, in, in what's next. And basically, in this trilemma of climate action, social justice, and democracy, what I think is the most, like, um, uh, compromised is basically social justice. And then in the second place, it is cl climate act action. Because we are thinking about climate action, I mean, um, not from, a, uh, from an equitable point of view. So uh, the EU is focusing on playing a, the protagonist role uh, in politics, in democracy, but this is coming at the expense of climate action. How is it so? Uh, because the momentum here uh, to keep, as it was mentioned indeed, the momentum to keep climate action in the fore isn't because of the environmental uh, goals and aims that have been initially set, but it's because we want to get rid of this reliance uh, on uh, oil and gas from, for example, the GCC and from uh, Russia. So we want to go for an, alter for, for an economic alternative. And when it comes to social justice, as, as, they, uh, as the EU is dealing with uh, democratic or political uh, issues with uh, the energy transi transition, so socioeconomic uh, factors and, um, uh, and elements are in oblivion. They're being forgotten about. The reason here takes me back to the central idea that I had mentioned, that we are interconnected but disintegrated, and that there is a very large spillover effect between the different economies. So, for example, a slight improvement in the Syrian economy will have a, um, spillover, a positive spillover effect on Lebanon, although we, we don't like to admit that, and, and, so, and so on and so forth, etc. for, uh, for uh, examples. The second reason is actually what um, Nadim Houri uh, mentioned and what Lori reiterated, it is the lack of a clear and unified strategic vision for engagement with the southern neighborhood on the part of the EU. It's lacking this. And by lacking this, it is also lacking the standard systematic participatory processes uh, that are like on a macro level, not surgical. For example, in Lebanon, that is the 3RF program, whereby indeed the EU is trying to, um, to consult with civil society organization. But if we are to, to look at the global picture, we do not see these processes. And when it's consulting, it's not consulting with the knowledge producing civil society. It is consulting with the implementing civil society that take the form or that uh, have this like NGOization uh, trait. Uh, regarding EU's role amid the current status quo, uh, to, 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 to wrap this up, I need to mention three 
uh, ideas, sorry. And then wrap up. <laughs> so basically, just to, to, to wrap this up and to give you the essence uh, in, from a forward-looking perspective, because I dwelt so much on the diagnostic, and uh, I'm sure you agree why, or you understand why is it so. Uh, the EU's role under the current status quo from a socioeconomic perspective, uh, I think if you are to identify priority areas, three priority areas, and these were mentioned, trade, migration, and the financing, or the aid. Uh, from a trade perspective, uh, the EU should help the southern Mediterranean countries r rationalize their imports, shift away from export, the export-led approach in many economic sectors, like in agriculture, and also um, to contain and keep control of the prices of goods and services domestically. So to do that, the EU should rethink its free trade agreements. And this predates the crisis. This predates the EU crisis. Uh, the, sorry, the Ukraine, uh, the, the war on Ukraine. But it does need to rethink the free trade agreements in Morocco and in Tunisia. Instead of doing this, it is now thinking of expanding this model to Egypt. So, uh, and, and how is this hampering uh, those economies or uh, the good of these economies? The quotas, it's, it's controlling the quotas, the tariff floors, the tariff ceilings, uh, what they import, what they export. So it is uh, coming to the detriment or it's deterring the economic competitive advantage of, uh, of, of these economies, not allowing them to uh, actually improve or recover. On the migration side, we know that there, that there is like this huge satura saturation um, uh, I mean, in Europe with the Ukrainian refugees, and we know that the asylum seekers from Syria have exponentially increased in the past uh, few years. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip the statistics to, to make it shorter, but in general, also from, from Syria, from Syrian neighboring countries, and from different Arab countries, we see that amid the current socioeconomic situation that is very bad, instead of protesting, we're seeing people migrating. So they, are, so they, they changed strategies, now they just want to migrate. Uh, the EU is some, somewhat bargaining uh, using the refugees to extract more, resource, more resources from the GCC and from, uh, from the South. Instead, the EU should rethink its financing practices because it is these, the financing practices that reflect EU's position vis-a-vis -vis migration. What the EU is trying to do is, and here I'm using uh, Lori's words, it is trying to stabilize systems. Uh, that are very chaotic uh, in, in the Arab region, especially in host communities. They're trying to stabilize those systems, uh, to keep them in power, and to give band aid to both the host communities and to the refugees so that they stay what, where they are and they do not go back uh, or they do not uh, come uh, to, to Europe. This is what it is doing. Um, it should rethink, def definitely rethink this approach. And this takes me to the last point, which is the financing question, the last point, which is the financing question. So the EU pretends to be providing budget support, okay? But, and, and, and that is through the poverty alleviation programs that it's trying to implement uh, through its grants. I mean, luckily these are grants and not loans, but at the same time, but these grants make a big sum of money, and this is simply wasting development money on humanitarian aid, on um, transient, small-scale, fragmented, not integrated, inadequate uh, social assistance uh, that are not effective, that are not sustainable, that are not long-sighted, and that do not build uh, an infrastructure that is more sustainable that, and that can provide more universal social security or social protection systems. So this is one. Uh, the second is that it's, um, uh, it's also um, giving somewhat, like it's like making the states look good and it's uh, helping them last more in power. And this approach is also causing social inertia. People are not protesting because they are, they are benefiting from this band aid. I mean, this is one of the reasons, but the social inertia or the social APC that we are seeing now, it is indeed because of those like, of the social assistance that is very uh, surgical and reactive that EU and other international donors are doing. And it's helping the state evade its responsibility and not understand that it is its role, its responsibility to actually provide this protection to its people amid the socioeconomic condition and not give it uh, to the EU. Um, on the positive note, uh, trespassing the governments through using trans-state actors and the intermediary for the, fi for the funding uh, channeling, this is, this is positive. Uh, and on the positive note is that given, I mean, we do not have um, social protection systems 
Um, we cannot have those social protection systems in the short to medium run. We say sometimes that it is good that we have the social assistance that the EU is providing uh, better than nothing. Um, to, to, to end on the financing part, the key role of the EU here is on, in climate financing. Climate financing is very important, and this is a starting point to think of climate action from a justice uh, perspective instead of co-opting it by speaking about the role of the private sector and the role of private financing. Uh, climate financing, the way it is being used now, it's used as credit swaps. So we use climate finance to cancel, uh, to cancel all debt. And this is very unfair because the debt that was accumulated already by, by the southern Mediterranean countries was accumulated on the old system and the current system, which is very inequitable. It was accumulated because, uh, because of different practices that we know of that I'm gonna go, not going to go into. So instead, the EU should help change this model and turn the climate financing into the benefit of the southern countries because it is a very precious opportunity, uh, honestly. And it should help uh, the, I mean, from a consultative perspective and from a funding perspective, it should help the southern countries in their debt restructuring and in how they spend uh, the, the debt. It should increase the ODA, the Official Development Assistance. Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm, I can carry on later, probably. <laughs> should, should I? Finish, finish. Yes, to finish, I'm going to just enumerate. It should increase its provision of ODA, and it can do that because it has got more than 20% of the total voluntary contributions to, to the OECD. Um, the EU has, in, in terms of voting power, its share is more than 21% of the IMF uh, total quota. So the, the EU can really help us uh, do the lobbying on the level of the IMF in its financing approach when it comes to the conditionalities that entail austerity, privatization, and interest rate surcharges. If they control 20, 21%, they do have voting and lobbying power. So this is one thing. Um, and it should also play a role in positive con conditionality or in benign conditionality. We have seen success stories when it comes to that. Uh, for example, the World Bank forced uh, the, the Lebanese government through um, the, the first safety net, social safety net program and the second to build building blocks for a universal social registry that would never be a political will to do that without the donors exerting this like a positive conditionality. In Egypt now, they're exerting a positive conditionality in this, uh, on, on, on uh, the level of not uh, handing the economic activity uh, over to the military anymore. And we're seeing improvements. I don't know if these will last, I doubt, but we're seeing improvements. Uh, so basically, um, yeah, I can stop here now for, for real. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for allowing me to, uh, to actually carry on. So thank you very much, uh, Farah, Lots for bringing energy, us uh, to the ground and to see uh, which are the socioeconomic consequences of uh, things that we usually look at from a very general perspective, uh, <coughs> geopolitical or macroeconomic, forgetting what's the reality on the ground and the impact on the lives of people. Uh, but uh, I admit that it's difficult to put in 10 minutes time uh, as many ideas as you wanted to put forward. So we'll invite you to, to put it in, in written form and we will publish it uh, uh, so that uh, I do not feel so much guilty to uh, <laughs> no, no <worries>. stop you. <laughs> so thank you very much. I, uh, you deserve really to uh, have a coffee break, but uh, I cannot spare giving the possibility if anyone wants to put a question or a comment Well, uh, oh yes, so the anxiety for, to put the question is stronger than the desire for coffee. That's good. <laughs> Go ahead. No, now, now. Uh, sorry to, to, to keep you away from your, from your coffee for, for a couple of minutes. But, I'm sorry. Uh, but this has been such an outstanding panel that I, I could not let you go. <laughs> I simply could not let you go. And I would actually uh, ask questions to each of you, but of course, um, the president is looking at me and saying no, <laughs> because we have to go to the coffee, we have to keep um, the program. Uh, so I only have one question, because many of you, either you come from or you traveled from Beirut, mm -hmm. or you have a Lebanese uh, background, and of course, uh, I mean, many of you 
have referred to the, to the current, to the ongoing situation in, in Lebanon. And we cannot let it go. I mean, in the next session, we will probably focus more on the, on the, Maghreb, uh, on the Maghreb countries. But um, of course, um, thinking about what you just now outlined, Farah, I mean, all the policy measures that we will try to, well, if you, uh, if you have the time to put them into paper, well, to convey them to the, to the uh, decision makers, but how can we move on if the state is vanishing? Because the current situation in Lebanon, unlike the situation, because Lebanon has always had different crises. It's like, uh, uh, you spoke about circularity, but we can also speak about different cycles. But the current situation in Lebanon is probably much worse than what we have seen before. So how can you really implement, not all of them, but some of them, when the state is really vanishing? Yes. Should I go ahead? Yeah, so I go ahead. I'm sure Lori might, <laughs> might, <laughs> Lori might have more, more ideas to add. Uh, uh, basically, basically, it, it, it is very difficult because there is no political will at all to, uh, I mean, there is no political will and they do not see this, I mean, the, the Lebanese government does not see this as a priority and we are still in a situation of a political deadlock, in my opinion. Uh, so it, this is very difficult. Now, given this de facto situation that it is difficult and probably impossible, like for example, as we uh, try to, uh, to advocate for universal social protection, we know that this is totally against the, the complex political economy of the Lebanese government to have a universal social protection. So we know this is not possible. So the, the solution is to take it one policy at a time, one step at a time, one decree at a time. So we're trying to make improvements on the level of programs, of, of policies, one by one. And here comes the role of the EU, of international donors, and of trans-state actors like the ILO, like UNICEF, like uh, the UNDP, and many that are playing this intermediary role. The funding is being channeled to the uh, government through them. They're implementing. So I, I mentioned the negative side of that, but it is for the time being, given the current situation, it is what it is. The, the second is actually this positive conditionality. Because you are giving them money, as in the EU or the donors, because they are giving money to the government, then they can force the government to make some governance reforms. They can uh, force, they should impose uh, monetary and evaluation and uh, transparency and accountability mechanisms. Like, for example, when the IMF gave the SDRs to the Lebanese uh, government, the central bank took, uh, took managed this, the SDRs, they did not, yeah, they, they did not uh, usually, so they did the same st standard process that is being adopted globally, not to give any conditionality, not to uh, give any uh, transparency and accountability mechanisms as to how to spend them. They should, in my opinion. Okay. Can I Thank just you. Yes, add one uh, point? any one of the panels, any final comment or yes. latest reflection? Uh, so again, uh, just to uh, give you uh, an example of how the politics and the real, uh, real politics that uh, Nadim maybe was talking about, how the EU is dealing with this situation. So basically, the EU has delegated uh, the, um, uh, the powers to solve the crisis or to, 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 to find the solution, whatever, to France. And France is playing a very negative role. I'm sure like uh, Farah will agree or anyone that is in, in this yes. room uh, and, and this Lebanese will agree with that. So I'm sorry to say that France is playing a very bad role in uh, trying to seize the opportunity of the crisis to advance its own economic and political agenda in the country. On, uh, 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 like, and this is really bad for the people that are suffering uh, in the country. So maintaining uh, a rela good, strong relations with the uh, de facto powers in the country that a lot of Lebanese are fighting is something that will never be forgotten by, by, by the Lebanese of what uh, Mr. Macron uh, has done. So uh, basically what they're doing, it's like under the name of stabilizing the country and they don't want migration or migrants to go, they're, 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 France is advancing its own agenda in the country. And so basically there are now, uh, there are deals that were made uh, for the port, acquisition of some of the uh, assets in the port, so-called by French Lebanese company, 
the, uh, the uh, Liban post, whatever, the post of Lebanon, again, again, the same company. There are talks about other, uh, other as well, like sectors that are being ta overtaken by the same company, etc. And the name that these are like Lebanese origins, so they're helping the country, but they're, still, they're putting a, 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 a strong foothold of the France, uh, France in the country. So this is what's happening. And it is very important, like we are in the deepest of the peace of the crisis. And the last thing a country, a European country should be doing that using the crisis for their own benefit. But this is what France is doing today in the country. And this is what is prolonging actually the lifeline of the government, current government, Terkeke government. And this is what is prolonging the issue of not finding a solution for the presidential elections in the country. So there's a void. France is supporting one candidate against others' wills. And this is how the interference is happening in the country. And this is a European country that's also, that is supposed to have values. But now this is how it's being uh, played in our, in our countries, unfortunately. Well, okay, I, I have to say that, that it's is, taken out of my system. I see that there this is, is my political hat yeah. now, not my energy I hat. I see that there is a contraposition between the higher expectations that Lebanese always have because of their positive tradition with France so high expectations that uh, cannot really meet the situation now, and this leads to this uh, contradiction. Uh, but uh, well, let's hope that this can improve. Uh, yes, James. The mandate <coughs> era, era has has been forgotten. Like you know, a, a, they a very, cannot play the same card anymore. A very quick That's comment. I don't want to get between people in their coffee. I have faith in the Lebanese people, and we have uh, good examples here. I don't have much faith in the Lebanese state, but I never did. I think Lebanon, Lebanon will eventually return uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to a state of stability. Uh, I'm more worried when you talk about vanishing states, I'm more worried about Libya than I am about Lebanon. Anyway, over to you. I mean, Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> don't put me in my Over corner. Louis. I'm corner in now. I mean, what I do is uh, not policies, communicating on policies. So I'm hoping that policies will improve so I can tell a good story. But, uh, you know, uh, my, my challenge uh, with Lebanon is that, uh, and with the EU in the region, in fact, the main challenge for me is to find, to dig up the good stories to tell, you know. And sometimes I have to dig a lot, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. But I, but I agree with Ambassador Moran, you know, the Lebanese have this unique um, sense of, of entrepreneurship and, and so on, and, and you have to have faith in, in the Lebanese, not only in the Lebanese, across the region, and I end with this. My meetings, I usually meet with young people, right? We have uh, in the EU a network of uh, goodwill ambassadors, you know, uh, Libya and so on and so forth. These are brilliant minds, brilliant minds that are uh, a great example of, of the future of this region, and that means that we need to invest in the youth. Don't forget that this region is a region where you have uh, by far, many more young people than in our own continents, you know. And so the future of the region is there. It's right in front of our eyes. Let's stop looking at the MENA region in terms of crisis, right? And let's begin looking at it in terms of yeah, yeah. brilliant youth, hope, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, skills and so on. This is, a, this is what we need to do. It's a very good point. I think it's a very good uh, final uh, point. And uh, it's interesting that the final point referred mainly uh, to Lebanon, eh? because uh, it's one of the most uh, sensitive parts of the Euro Mediterranean yeah. world. And uh, you're, I would say, especially in it, uh, because of uh, many circumstances <laughs> that have affected you in all senses, but in a very negative way. And I hope that you will be able to continue to work with your own people and with your friends as, as you have always done along millennia. And you are still there, well, <laughs> not well at all, <laughs> completely, but uh, surviving and alive. And I'm, that's, that's the, the, the youth of your country and your people is the best promise uh, for the future. So thank you very much for your patience and for your uh, interest in following this session. And now we go for a coffee break, unless there is some urgency by somebody. No? Okay, so let's go for a coffee. Bravo.